Well, good evening, everybody. I've got six o'clock on my computer. I see people are still joining us. Um, so <laughs> I was just reading a question in chat, sorry. Uh, I've got six o'clock on my computer and tonight is the Laramie County Master Gardener class program on prairie ecology and living on the land and some, some tips and do's and don'ts for what it takes to live out there because it's certainly different <laughs> than living in town. And I also have a guest speaker tonight and at Cheryl Eddie Miller and she is from the USGS and she will talk to us about groundwater and some of the things she's found and knows and to help us be better stewards of our groundwater, which, you know, in an amazing invisible resource, I think we take it from grant for granted. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl and have her um, teach for the what, for the first 30, 45 minutes. And then when uh, Cheryl's done, we'll take a brief break. And we'll come back and then I'll pick up and do the, the prairie ecology and the grass and wildflowers and all sorts of other stuff that goes on out in the prairie. Or if you're moving to the prairie, um, <laughs> this is a good, a good beginner introduction to, to living out there. So with that, Cheryl, I'm going to turn it over to you. And it's all yours. Okay. Well, I have given this presentation of, of some way, shape, or form for several times to the Master Gardener group. And um, usually I have a physical ant farm looking thing to explain how groundwater works. And um, unfortunately that can't be done, um, not in person. So my humongous visual aid that does all the work for me is not available. So I, um, I hope I can present to you things that you find helpful and useful to be able to understand groundwater and how potential contamination can occur. I did find a video that if I can figure out how to switch screens, we'll try to work. So um, I hope you can find this beneficial, but I um, have to bear with me a minute. I'm not a, a Zoom user, I'm a Teams user. So I'll have to be clicking through things. But if anything is glitching, by all means, let me know because um, while I'm on Teams calls all day long, I don't present on it very much. So let me know if something glitches. Okay, we'll keep you informed. Okay, well with that, I'll start uh, a few slides I have. And I, I have, a few, but I click through them pretty quickly because I don't trust them zooming in on me. So I just make a whole bunch of slides. So let me see if I can share the screen. And then I will start this as a slideshow. So far, so good. Yep. Okay, so going with the flow, how water and chemicals move in the ground. So the four things I kind of wanted to touch on tonight, and while it seems like it might be a lot, it really is they tie together pretty well, is to look at the groundwater and the model that I found online that hope we can watch it move through there. Um, talk a little bit about a statewide pesticide sampling program that I've been involved with for about 25 years, looking at both groundwater and surface water. I felt this was useful to give you all perspective on what the state of our water is within the state and how pesticides play a role in that. Look at how groundwater contamination happens and the movement of groundwater and then have a few Laramie County specifics included in there. So that's, those are the things I plan to speak about. So the first part is something you probably all remember from third grade of the hydrologic cycle of uh, water moving through, through our atmosphere into precipitation and surface water and running off into the oceans. And that obviously occurs, but a really hidden part of it is the fact that groundwater is a key role. This is a cutoff on the side. And when rain falls on the ground, if it doesn't make a puddle or run off into the lakes or the rivers, then it infiltrates into the groundwater and discharges either from springs where there's maybe a depression, or if you drill a well in the ground, then that's when you can capture groundwater for your own use. So that's orienting you to the hydrologic cycle, starting you out on the third grade refresher. So here's, we're gonna see if I can make this one work. Um, can you still see my screen now? Yep. All right, oops, pause. All right, I'm gonna turn this up really loud. 
and maybe move this to the center and zoom it up a little. Let's see if we can make this work. Okay, so this is similar to what I have, oops, I went too far, physically. And he's going to give his own little discussion about what he's showing in this video. But I think this is going to be, this is as good as I can get. Sometimes even with real ground. This model is designed to do just that. It simulates the flow of groundwater around an obstruction to illustrate the morphology and velocity of the flow. It's made of quarter inch acrylic sheets cut to size on the table saw. Solvent welding is used to connect the acrylic sheets into a narrow box. All of the plumbing is composed of aquarium bulkhead fittings and clear nylon tubing. Everything was leak tested before the sand was added. Here's how it works. Potassium permanganate is added to three spots in the top of the sand. A pump in a bucket below keeps a constant head pressure on one side of the model. The differential between the water level in both sides is what drives the water to flow from one side to the other. Groundwater flowing through the sand creates traces of the flow lines over the course of several hours, illustrating exactly what we estimated earlier with the flow net. The flow of groundwater hasn't always been so well understood. In fact, for some states, regulation of the pumping of groundwater is established on explicit ignorance of its behavior. In a landmark case which submitted the rule of capture into Texas water law in 1904, the court said that groundwater movements are so secret, occult, and concealed that regulating the use of groundwater would be practically impossible. Fortunately, geotechnical engineers since then have the foundation of knowledge around the flow of water in the subsurface. Okay, I'm going to back this up a second so, and explain one thing that we're looking at and, and talk a little bit about it. Is that, let me get to the right spot. So right here, you can see that water on the right side of this tank is higher, has a higher head than the water on the left side. Groundwater flows for the same reasons that surface water flows. It's just gravity. So gravity will pull this, push the water through here, obviously, and make it go up on the other side. Even without this piece of plastic in here, the flow paths will look similar. So on the model I have, I use this as a side and sometimes we get the groundwater level high and pretend this is a river. This is how groundwater actually discharges into a river and it is how then that contaminants that maybe are on the ground not only can move into the groundwater, but then you can actually push them up into surface water sources as well. So you can see that even though it's kind of a myth that groundwater flows through underground rivers, but it really doesn't. The way it flows is in between the particles of rocks. So the sand or the gravel or whatever else there is flow through. That's, that's the mechanism in which groundwater flows. So while obviously he was doing this for a geotechnical class, because there are a lot of equations you can then use in order to calculate what this flow is going to look like in a real life situation, this is a great example of how it actually moves and how groundwater and then potentially contamination can go from one place to another. Um, does anyone have any questions they want to ask on this? Because it's, it's groundwater obviously is invisible. You can't see it underground. So it's so much easier to look at what's happening with this type of model. If you have, y'all, if you have any questions, go ahead and just jump in. Um, you can raise your hand virtually. <laughs> Um, or just jump right in and ask a question, okay? Because the, the whole groundwater thing is very complicated, but it's important to know if you're out on the prairie. Um, go ahead, yeah, Un unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. Or, or type it in to chat. So the underground aquifers aren't so much uh, what I would think of as an aquifer. It's water moving through rock, basically. Is that right? 
That is the definition, frankly, of an aquifer, is basically underground rocks or geologic units that contain water. And to groundwater in general is, is in almost every rock. The true definition of an aquifer means that it's extractable in a quantity that's useful for people. So if you can use it to water stock or irrigation, then it's considered an aquifer. But all, almost all, it's really, really rare to have any sort of rock material or any, any underground material that does not contain water in it. How easy it is to get out is the whole other story, but almost everything has water underground. So are some of the spaces between the rocks quite large then I assume. So when you dig a well, it's sitting like in a pool, which would be a, or not. Think about it as if you have a cup of ice water. So you have a cup of ice, you pour the water in there and you put a straw in there. If you put holes on all sides of that straw, you'd bring in, bringing in water from all of the parts of the aquifer there, not just a pool at the bottom or on a particular side, you'd be bringing water in from all sides of it. And so that's kind of how this picture looks. You can see that water is moving through all places in here. So if you had a well, say, where this, where this plastic divider was, you'd be pulling water in from all of these locations over here. It's gonna just bring it in because you, you drop the water table when you pump a well. So you're gonna make it so the water is down at this level. So it's gonna, just because of gravity and pressure heads, it's gonna bring it all into that, that well right there. And that's how you'll be able to extract it. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. That's interesting. Okay. How far away from contamination will the, will, if you have to be, how, I mean, it probably varies on the location, but how far from a contaminated site before your site is contaminated? So that's a really good question. The, a lot of, some of this is, comes up with talking about fracking as well. And so at my very last slide is going to talk about some of the different aquifers in Laramie County. But in Laramie County, like I live rurally, I'm sitting on what's known as the High Plains Aquifer. So we're sitting on something here that's over most of Laramie County. And it's a mixture of gravels and sands and a few clay layers. So it's pretty permeable. In other words, it can water and contaminants could potentially move through. It's all relative in how quick it can move, but it can move through rather easily. Now, the, the units, the geologic units that they're fracking in are really, really super tight shales. So there's really not very much space in between them. And there's not a lot of, it's really hard for the water to move back and forth. And think about like modeling clay and trying to move water through modeling clay versus a pile of sand. You can just pour water on top of sand and it's going to soak in and move. Where the modeling clay, if you poured water on it and you waited 10 years, it would soak in and be gone. So where they are doing the fracking is in that really super tight geologic formation that's about four to 6,000 feet above land surface. So they're drilling all the way down there and then they're putting the pressure out in there. So they are using chemicals that are not great if you were drinking them. But the chance of you having any impact, and we have done studies in Montana, the USGS has in other places, is that the movement is so slow that even if there were leaks in places, your, your impact and your potential for having, an, having something happen from that fracking is really, really small. I'll talk about it at the end. Here in rural Laramie County, our biggest potential for contamination is from our own septic tanks. Because the septic tank's goal is to you know, contain the septic water and then put it out on the landscape so the plants can use it. But infiltration does happen. And so if you have put your septic tank in the wrong spot, or it's really near a well, you can intercept that septic water before it is being able to be used completely or, or processed by microbes in the ground. And that short circuit is truly where most of our contamination in our county occurs. It, it's not from um, underground storage tanks or energy development. The most, the most true contamination really becomes from septic tanks. So Cheryl, you said that um, in that shale formation that the water moves very slowly Yes. Do you have any idea what slowly is? Okay, so in really fast, fast would be like sand. You could probably move like it with, because it depends on pressure. Just like in this picture, it depends on pressure in that um, if, if you have a huge amount of pressure head, things will move faster regardless of what your material are. Where if you have very little gradient to make it move, 
that's a different. But in say sand with the same amount of pressure of something that might take a week, it could take decades or even longer in those shales because they are so tight that it's really difficult for things to move through for that same like foot distance type of thing. Okay. So groundwater moves typically on the order of magnitude of like a couple feet per day in the really fast stuff to tens to millions of years in the really tight locations where there's not much of a gradient. We use that information to be able to help understand it. I'm really diverging, but we have techniques that look at say um, tritium from when the bombs occurred at World War II. We can actually date groundwater from when it was captured and recharged based on some chemicals that happened to be in it or CFCs, human-made chemicals. So we use that in order to understand how groundwater recharge, which is it soaking into the ground to get into the groundwater, as well as the movement through that system. Cheryl, yes. how, how does one locate aquifers? Like I remember the Madison Aquifer being developed in Crook County years ago to service basically Gillette. Um, it, you mentioned drilling, but what are the sources to find that water? Well, um, so honestly, I give tons of credit to the local drillers. I mean, as a, as a hydrologist or, you know, a geo professional myself, I can look, I know about the different geologic units and which ones would potentially contain water at the lowest of depth. Because if you're, yes, the city of Gillette had to go pretty deep for that Madison aquifer in order to have high quality water because it sits on deposits that are much more salty just because of the situation, whether it be oceanic or whatever those rocks were deposited in, they tend to have a lot of, of natural chemicals in them. So they had to drill really deep to get to the Madison to get water that didn't have a lot of dissolved salt in it essentially. And so you can, you know, if, if someone is familiar with, uh, you know, looking at the geologic units, you can make inferences as to what type of quality they're going to have but truly the local drillers are gonna know. And if you're putting in your own well for your home, it's, um, you don't wanna go really deep because they, they'll get you into thousands of dollars very quickly. It depends on where you're at. My well is 500 feet deep because that's how much I needed in order to make sure I had enough uh, water flowing in. Some people have wells that end up being 50 feet deep. Some people have a thousand. It just kind of depends on where you're at and how you sit within the aquifer. So Cheryl, a question here in chat from Kathy. It says, I'm going to assume that the water that leaks into my basement is not part of an aquifer, but rather I sit on a natural runoff area. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but there are some things even um, in Cheyenne that you can have what's called a perched aquifer. So if you can imagine like a sand pile like this, can you see my cursor on the screen? Mm -hmm. So if you had a sand pile like this, and let's say when all these rocks were being deposited, like running off from Vita Vu and, and you know, millennia ago and depositing in this area, it's gonna be a little bit heterogeneous. And some places around Cheyenne actually have spots where they have a clay layer that makes this little tiny bathtub kind of thing. And so you can get what's called a perched aquifer. So when water infiltrates, it sits right there in the little pond area and it doesn't continue to infiltrate downward. So sometimes if you can be in an area that's perched, it can be groundwater. You're right, it depends on what the drainage is like around your house or how saturated things are. But so it could be a variety of things. It, it might be groundwater or it just might be a localized drainage problem or challenge. It's a problem because it's in your basement, but <laughs> situation. Yeah, I'm just going. All right, were there any other questions in the chat, Catherine? I'm not. Oh, no, that's, I think we got temporarily answered some questions here. Okay, well, that's great. And I can come back to any of these at any time. Okay. Um, okay, let's try to see if I can. Okay, so I, I, I don't mean to breeze through these so you don't understand them, but I just, I just wanted to kind of give you ideas to foster thoughts. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. So how we talked a little bit about how um, contaminants, and like I mentioned, I've worked with pesticides for a long time. How does that get into the groundwater? Well, here's our hydrologic cycle again of all the different ways that 
that pesticides move through the hydrologic cycle. So we have issues with things seeping in. We have recharge from streams because it can go the other way that streams, especially when they're high, they recharge the groundwater. That's part of the groundwater surface water system around rivers. Um, so all these different ways are how pesticides in particular can get into the hydrologic cycle and then how they can end up in groundwater. Um, so this is a super brief overview of 25 years of pesticide data that we've collected in the state. And part of it is just to make you aware of the fact that the Wyoming Department of Agriculture, in cooperation with a lot of agencies around the state, it being um, uh, you know, the Department of Environmental Quality, the Weed and Pest Districts, the Cooperative Extension from University of Wyoming, a lot of us are involved with, with doing some of this sampling to ensure, frankly, that the state is still allowed to use pesticides for the necessary needs that it has to be agriculture or, or um, you know, um, human health issues that, uh, pertaining to say mosquitoes or things like that. The, the Department of Ag is, is the lead on this team that, that's goal is to really keep an eye on how, what the impacts of pesticides are in Wyoming's water. Um, so, what we are, we'll look at is what kind of findings we've had, where we sampled, how people then are using the data. So at the very beginning, back in 1995, I don't know what that's up there, uh, we started a project where we looked in every single county in areas where the groundwater was vulnerable to pesticides due to its inherent vulnerability, meaning it was like um, an aquifer that was really porous and really you know, had movement in that that was really quick as well as the fact that it was the depth to groundwater was really close. Cause you can imagine if you're 10 feet from the ground surface to groundwater or you're a hundred feet, it's gonna make a big difference on how vulnerable your, your aquifer is to activities on the surface. So we overlaid that with um, land use and we ended up focusing our sampling on areas that had high or medium high vulnerability. Pesticide samples cost around $5,000 a piece to analyze. So we really had to focus on where we were going to be sampling. This is not random sampling. We are sampling specifically in the areas that are the highest vulnerability in order to find out if we can find anything there. So we, we recognize this is a biased data set, um, but that's okay. As long as we know it is, it's okay that it's biased. Okay, so we, we as you can imagine, land use does make a difference. So the wells that we sampled had either an agriculture or urban, and I use urban pretty loosely because this is Wyoming urban. This is, Thermopolis counts as urban. So, you know, it's a loose definition. Um, they might've had a mixed land use around the well, and then very few of them then were considered undeveloped land uses. All the wells, we tried to make them shallow, so less than a hundred feet, low volume, domestic stock or monitoring wells, we couldn't handle irrigation wells or municipal wells. Um, and then you'll see in lots of pictures, we have lots of Teflon and stainless steel we use in sampling because the methods or the, the detection limits that we're looking at for these compounds are in the part per billion and part per trillion level. So it's really important that we're not cross-contaminating when we sample from site to site. So in about 10 years worth of time, we sampled all these sites that are dots around the state, kind of in a county by county basis over that period of time. Um, and the sites with red dots were where we had pesticide detections. The, the ones with black dots were where we didn't have detections. So um, you can see, I'm pretty sure that's the next slide. Nope, it's not. But you'll see in a second <laughs> that the, the detections were focused more in the Bighorn Basin and then in what we're calling the, the Casper Arch Platte River Basin in this particular area. Those were the bulk of the detections were. Um, really important point is that no pesticide has been detected above a standard. In 25 years of sampling, we have over 700 samples. We have definitely found detections of pesticides, but very few even approach a drinking water standard, like 10 samples specifically, that's it. And we have sampled for 25 years. So as a colleague of mine says, this ain't Iowa. Um, we're very fortunate because we don't have the intensity of people to make it so we have a have our groundwater having detections. Um, we, we look for a total of about 165 different pesticides every time we take a sample. 
or their breakdown or degradation products. So that's, I think, really the good news is that, you know, people in the state do use pesticides for a variety of reasons, and and um, that's that's regulated and restricted. But um, the good news is that, that we do not have detections above the standard. So what kinds of pesticides are we looking for? We're looking for um, herbicides are about half of what's the of those 165. We have some insecticides and a few fungicides. And in Wyoming, our groundwater, anything that's these really light color, we have never detected those. So the bulk of those 165 different pesticides, we've never detected. These that are over here in the, in the little bit darker colors, we detect them every once in a while. I say infrequently. We've detected them a handful of times of each of those individual pesticides. This little piece right here, we have four pesticides that we detect pretty frequently, about over 20% of the time. And these are those pesticides over there on the side. Now we'll come back to this one over here, this Promaton, because act because of the sampling effort, the actions of this pesticide have changed and that people started realizing that this is a problem because we're starting to see it in the groundwater. And so um, the weed and pest districts started telling people, okay, don't use this one. It's a soil sterilant. They put it underneath parking lots or near ro railroads so they don't catch fire <laughs> on the side of the railroad. Um, they're like, this is not a good product to use because it moves too easily. So we need to switch up what we're doing. And so act actions have actually happened based on the results of our sampling efforts. Um, as I mentioned, we are more often uh, detecting in those basins and those areas around the state for two reasons. One is because of urban and one is because of the ag use. So what does it look like when we have urban compared to ag? Well, actually urban wells had a much, more li much higher likelihood of having a pesticide detection in it. So if you were in an urban area and you had a well, there was a 60% chance that it would have a pesticide in it. If you're in an agricultural area, there was only a 40% chance that your well would have a detection in it. So while the urban area had fewer pesticide detections, like fewer meaning like maybe three or four different type of compounds, and there was a much bigger variety in agriculture, there was a much more higher likelihood in urban areas. This really surprised us when we first started sampling and we actually changed some of our surface water sampling um, locations based on this. But we really feel that it's probably because the homeowner, like the city homeowner, per acre, they can afford to put on more <laughs> than what maybe the label says, yeah. where the big producers, that's their bottom dollar. And they tend to be have the weed and pest advice or the conservation district advice. And they had a little bit more precision in their applications where we really, in doing interviews, the um, Ag Extension and Weed and Pest did some follow-up on this in Department of Ag. And it really, we really feel that it's probably just a function of size and that in the urban areas, they, they could just put on a whole lot more product than they would in the agricultural areas. Um, so we realize that pesticide use changes, we realize it moves and the pot products that are used change. And so we've been continuing to look at these things over time. It's a bit of a broad brush just because it's so expensive, we, we go back. But the sites that we've gone back to at maybe the five year or even the 10 year period of time, we often see a similar amount of similar number of pesticides in the well in that there's about the same thing. But when a specific compound is detected, by and large, those compounds are either decreasing or similar. So we have yet to find thing that's like a giant red flag of like, okay, we have a problem with groundwater. This is, this is, um, this particular compound is really becoming a problem. And that promaton is a great example how it's going away. We actually are seeing things go away. They're either de declining or decreasing, and that's. That's very positive because groundwater takes forever for stuff to move through. And I like to say that instead of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, I say an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure because it's so expensive to pump stuff out in order to clean up and bring in clean water. So it's really important to keep it clean in the first place. Um, just because these are on people's um, radar, the new nicotinoids, these are the ones that are um, more in the news because of potential problems for honeybees. Um, 
we have started sampling for those and we have detected them occasionally in groundwater, but by and large, we don't see them very often. They're insecticides and so um, they're typically not, we don't have the use in Wyoming of insecticides that we do of herbicides. And I think probably just sheer numbers are why, part of the reason why we don't see any, as many. <clears throat> so I know this is a groundwater talk, but since we started with the hydrologic cycle, I have to at least discuss the surface water because it is a little bit different and our actions on the, on the land make, make in fact, the surface water as well. So surface water, because groundwater moves really slowly. So you can sample a well and sample it two years later and it's probably not that different where obviously surface water is going to be very different. A month later, two months later, it'll be very different. So our sampling protocol still is, is about once a year and we recognize it's just a snapshot. It's a really sh much shorter period of time, but it gives us some idea of what we're seeing. This, this measles, I don't know how to make this not look like the poor map has measles, but the whole point is just to say what's out there. Is, is, it, it, is, um, is it detected? Is it seasonally detected? And then we also added glyphosate, which is Roundup to our schedules. Um, we added that about a decade ago because of the occurrence of Roundup ready crops that were um, genetically modified seeds um, by Monsanto, I believe, so that glyphosate could be used broad spread on the field and not affect that particular crop. I, I believe it's primary a soybean seed, but it, there may be seed treatments for, there may be seeds that are also genetically modified for other things as well. Anyway, Roundup became, and, and glyphosate became a really common pesticide uh, about 10 years ago. Um, so what are the findings for surface water? We've had over 100 samples, we don't have quite the breadth. 33 sites, again, even in times where you expected higher concentrations of pesticides because you're, excuse me, lower flows or post application, we still have not seen pesticide of a bumpo drinking water standard. So that's the positive takeaway. <coughs> excuse me. So what do we see in there? About the same that we see of all the things we're sampling for, we just have these four they're a little bit different, but we just kind of have these four that are detected regularly, frequently, more than 20% of the time. That's actually not that frequent, but the rest of them are just a couple times. Okay, Cheryl? Yes. Yep, we got a question. So sure. April, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask? Yeah, um, you mentioned the drinking water standard a couple times, and I'm wondering where that comes from, who creates the standard? <laughs> Good question. That is... In Wyoming, EPA has primacy over drinking water, meaning that they're, they're the ones who have the standards. And so EPA is the one who has developed the standards. They do a lot of tests on, um, uh, there's a lot of math that goes into it. And then there's a, for risk analysis. And then they do do tests on other organisms, not humans. Um, based on that. So they develop the pesticide drinking water standards the same as they do the other compounds. There's drinking water standards for, you know, chloride or nitrate or total dissolved minerals. There's standards for most things, um, but EPA is whose who's standard that is. Um, as with the groundwater, uh, we most often detect them in the Bighorn or the High Plains North Platte Basin. Again, there's the most activity by people in there, whether it be ag or urban in those two basins. It's a little bit different in that in the urban areas, most sites did not have pesticides and a couple have a really weird variety of pesticides and it's partially because it's downstream of a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and so we think some stuff is, is probably coming out of that too. Um, Cause we have high levels of caffeine that we detect. <laughs> um, we actually can use caffeine as a tracer in groundwater too, to know about, you know, septic tank influent and short circuiting. There, there's some really create, I didn't invent that. So other people are really creative on how we can trace. Um, and then in the agricultural areas, we do have a larger variety of compounds and more common detections in the surface water. So it's not, it's a little bit different story in the surface water. Um, but the good news is, is that uh, when we go back to the same sites, the concentrations tend to be the same or even decreasing year to year, even though we're detecting it, I mean, sampling at different times of the year. We have, we've only detected twice some of the new nicotinoids. Um, this is just a list of what's been on there. And then um, that was new from, from just a couple of years ago, those were added. 
Um, so just a few things we're going through. Just, just to think about it, of how this data can be useful, because we recognize that it's not a regular random sampling. It is biased. We don't have enough surface water sites to know, talk about trends, and then to remember that we're using super low level detections. So we are using methods, analytical methods that are lower detection limits than what EPA has. But the good thing about that is that it can be early detection. So we can know something is there before it gets above a drinking water standard. But it does, again, bias your data because if you were, you know, let's say our detection limits can detect it at one and EPAs are at 10 and we have a whole bunch of things at six. Well, we're like, there's tons out there because it's at six and our detection limit at one says it's there. But if you were at 10, you wouldn't see anything. So we recognize that our data set is going to have more detections than if you'd used a different method. Um, so why do these things look so different in the groundwater versus surface water? We, we touched on it a little bit that the flow rates are different um, in the groundwater. I mean, the surface water, it's going to go off and get there where groundwater, it has to travel through the groundwater. And one of the key things, <coughs> and I'm going to, I know I'm jumping ahead of myself because it's a slide later, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of the key things is that when they design pesticides, you don't want these pesticides to go into the groundwater. You want them to stay in this on the plant or in that soil area. So they have properties to make them be sticky, like absorb onto the organic materials because it doesn't help the product to move it beyond, beyond the root zone. And so the, the soil retention of these different compounds is different between all of them. Just because of their complex chemical nature, it's going to be different. The other thing is, is Pesticides degrade. They're a really big giant organic molecule. And when they get just time or when they get UV on them, they're going to break apart and degrade. So, and they do that all differently as well. So there's a whole lot of differences on why we see things in groundwater versus surface water. This, this is data from UW Cooperative Extension. Um, Jeff Edwards put this together, looking at what is sold in our state in 2019. And by, by far, the most commonly sold pesticide is glyphosate, is Roundup. And so you can see here some of these other names, which I know they're horrible. I have to try to pronounce them and pretend I know what they are. Um, but they, they, you can see that all of these are um, herbicides and they far outweigh insecticides being sold. And this glyphosate is, is the one that's the highest. Hey, Cheryl. Uh, yeah. When Jeff put that together, did he differentiate between urban or agricultural use? He just overall sales? It's just overall sales. Okay. But you're right, it is an urban comp, it is an urban product as well. I mean, you can go buy Roundup in Walmart. So yep. um, that, that's a good question. Actually, I'm gonna write this down um, because that would be a good question to know of like what percentage he suspects comes from which source. And he may have the data. Okay, pardon just a second. <laughs> okay. well, I know that you can buy almost, you can buy most of these, the glyphosate 2,4-D dicambian mm -hmm. um, from, you can go to Murdoch's and pick that up. The Piclorin and Atrazine, Paraquat, those are all agricultural use along with MCPA, um, Bromacil, Fluoroxyprin yeah. and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other one. So most of those are agricultural, but the first three are, anyone can buy those, homeowner. Correct. Yep. So that's a really good question. I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ask and I'll, I'll know that because I'm actually writing a report right now about, you know, the 25 years worth of data and, and being able to compare it because it's, if you write it about what you found, I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. But if you have data about what's being sold, then it gives you some reference to, are we detecting it or not? What, what, what's being sold is that particular chemical showing up in the groundwater or right. is it a historical compound? I mean, to be able to understand that is, is part of what we're looking at doing. Yeah, it puts it into better context of who is using it. Mm -hmm. Where is it, where is it originating from? Yep. So I'm guessing, and this is a total guess, I'm guessing that the bulk of the glyphosate is now agricultural because of those Roundup ready crops, but um, that's a total guess. But um, those numbers are just so high. But I'll ask and find out. That's a really good question. Okay, and I am going way over, Catherine. Do you want me to? You're fine. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's, it's very difficult to uh, make direct comparisons because of the lags and the soil and pesticide properties. Um, I already talked about permaton. <laughs> but in, in surface water, the majority of the pesticides are herbicide. And as we talked about glyphosate being the biggest sold, we also is the highest detection. Glyphosate or one of its degradates or breakdown products is detected in over 60% of the samples of surface water. So we can, we can see um, a relation there. Uh, correlation is too strong because we don't have statistics to back it up, but we can see that the thing is the most sold corresponds with the thing we detect the most. Groundwater, because it have the, of all those other properties, we don't have any relations between either now or what we, we know as sales data from like 2009. So it's a little bit different story. Um, so the key points of this, just really wanna emphasize that pesticides of course are used in our state, but it's really, I think, heartening to know that nothing has been detected a drinking water standard by and large things are detected maybe once in a while and most products used are, are not showing up in our ambient groundwater. And when we did the sampling, when we designed the sampling program, even though we were focused on those biased areas that are most likely to be vulnerable, we didn't go around going, well, that looks like there's gonna be pesticides there. We kind of randomly sampled within those red or yellow areas. Um, again, in groundwater, urban land use is the most frequent detection. And in those two um, areas, um, there's a larger variety of pesticides in ag use. Um, again, this, reflects sales, the, the surface water does. So if you want to know something more about this, you know, quarter century of data collection, um, I have a website that has, um, and I know this is like a horrid website to try to write down it, but if you just Google USGS Pesticides Wyoming, all this page will come up and you can link to it and you can see the different reports, the different fact sheets. There's links on there to data. Um, that you can click and then you can see your area of interest and click to see if a sample has been, it'll show you little, um, a little marker for a site we've sampled. You can click on it and get all the data. So um, if you go to that main webpage, it's pretty straightforward to click through and find out what you're looking for. And if you can't, then you can, um, then you can contact me and I'm happy to point you in the right direction. So okay. Cheryl, uh, yes. quick, a quick question from Krista. She wants to know, how do we compare to the rest of the country for our groundwater? Well, that's a, Krista, are you referring to pesticides or are you referring to other things like other compounds in groundwater? Cause let me, I'm going to zoom here a second. <laughs> just, just kind of generally speaking. I mean, are we, it sounds like we're doing a very good job just keeping track of how how the water is and is it we're just really awesome in Wyoming or <laughs> are well, you we have the advantage of low population density and yeah. low intensity so I would say we were we're probably on par as you can imagine with places like Montana or other places that have similar land use to us as I you know mentioned earlier my colleague would say the same Iowa it's true they definitely have higher concentrations that it's above drinking water standards they see things spike you know, there's issues for pesticides um, in both their surface and groundwater. Now, when it comes to other compounds, this is what some of this work that we did, I uh, summarized, is looking at the different aquifers in Wyoming or in southeastern Wyoming. And there are natural chemicals that, that occur in groundwater based on the, the geologic material that that water is in contact with. It will over time dissolve minerals out of and other things out of there. So sometimes we'll have problems with selenium or arsenic or total dissolved minerals that it'll be really salty water. And that's just really because that's what's in that geologic unit. There has been no contamination of human activity. It's just naturally there. So um, like I said, we put together this report that just looked at these, what it, this is showing here is, is different general rock materials and all this brown is, is the High Plains aquifer that I was talking about. So if you're most anywhere in, in Laramie County, you're going to be able to drill a well into the High Plains aquifer. Um, 
part of the High Plains Aquifer is the Ogallala Aquifer that maybe you've heard about. It's really uh, prominent in, in, in a lot of, uh, from here, a little bit east and south, like Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, the, the um, Ogallala Aquifer is a really big deal, but there's a bunch of units that all interact with each other and they just call it the High Plains. That's what we have here. This yellow stuff is more, more recently deposited materials. It tends to be a little bit looser, easier to pump out of. Um, and then this green area up here, those formations around Hawk Springs, those, those mountainous areas there, those are a different type of bedrock aquifer. So that's what that's, that's showing. And that report is really focused on natural consistent constituents as well as well, I don't, didn't finish my sentence or I cut it off. <laughs> it's focused on natural constituents as well as things like pesticides and nitrates as well. Do, do we have a high amount of uranium in our water? <clears throat> Not here. No? Other parts in the state do, but we don't here. Okay. Thank you. In, in Western oh. Wyoming. So Cheryl, question here. Can you tell us anything about the governor approving wastewater being pumped into the Madison Aquifer? I honestly don't know about that. Um, so other than depends on where it's being pumped and depends on how it's being handled because I really do think there's nothing that's outright good or outright bad. It's going to depend on what the geologic situation is because there are parts of the Madison that are not as high quality. So um, I, I don't know about that one, but in general, it's not, it's, there are lots of places that pump uh, waste ground, waste water into the ground for capture. Um, I'm pretty sure Coastal Chemical, that's not who they're called anymore, does that out there, but they're putting it thousands of feet underground. It's gotta go somewhere that's how they're disposing of it. So it's a gray area, there's no good or bad answer. And I don't know enough about the discussion you're talking about really to have any educated opinion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the good news everybody is that Wyoming is a headwater state. So the water originates here. So we're, we're the first users of this water and then everyone else who's downstream from us, well, they're downstream. So the good news is we're first in line and we have some of the best water in the United States and Montana, Idaho, parts of Washington, um, part, northern parts of California also have good water, but it's it's a good thing to be a headwater state. And it definitely is. The groundwater thing is complicated. So Cheryl, what else? Well, so for Laramie County, I wanted to mention that, again, most compounds are below a drinking water standard, but not all. And you have to remember, these are compounds that are naturally in the system as well. Um, the most common chemical above a drinking water standard was nitrate. And that would be a function of um, a lot of times septic systems that are not working properly, um, that have not been pumped in a million years, or, you know, feeding operations, things like that. Nitrate's the most common one that occurs. It's a compound that causes um, blue baby syndrome and that in your bloodstream, uh, the nitrate molecule will, will make reactions happen so your blood cannot carry as much oxygen. So it's not just a carcinogen, but it is a health hazard. Um, and frankly, if you've got nitrate in there, there's a decent chance you've got other things as well if it's coming from a septic tank and things like that. Um, <clears throat> The other part is that we mentioned the aquifer source material is a really big influence on the concentrations of those natural chemicals. And that's when you need to talk to your local well driller about where, what the best aim for how deep you wanna go is so that you can shoot for the best quality of water and then you don't have to post treat afterwards. So I think that's the bulk of what, what I was, we, we diverged a few places here and there, but that was definitely the bulk of what I wanted, I thought would be interesting to cover. Well, I sure, I sure appreciate you taking time out of your evening to come talk to us. And um, for everybody watching, um, Cheryl's been teaching off and on for me for groundwater for um, 15 years. 
<laughs> and the groundwater model is just amazing. And then I had her teach for the advanced master gardeners and we all, they all got to be well drillers and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> so, so there's some great stuff that, um, that we do. And I sure appreciate your time again. For, You're very uh, welcome. I'm happy to be able to, you know, spread the word about a very mysterious, mysterious water source. So yeah. <laughs> you can't Cheryl. say it's hard to know. <laughs> Yep. Thank you, Cheryl. All right. You're very welcome. Thank you. All right. So let's take a five minute break. We'll come back and we'll talk about the stuff that grows on the surface. <laughs> so Cheryl, thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back. And again, you can go ahead and turn your video on and so we can see everybody. And I'm going to share my screen here. We'll start with the Prairie, uh, living on the Prairie, Prairie Ecology uh, class. Okay. All right. So once upon a time, the buffalo, uh, buffalo roamed every place out here, not so much anymore. But the prairie, um, it, it's kind of an interesting word itself, derived from the French word paraterra or meadow, which probably originated from the Latin, Latin word pratum. French explorers and trappers moving to the West um, described it as a sea of grass. So the prairie is usually temperate climate, not always, but usually you, it's, it's usually intercontinental and it's, it's relatively flat to rolling hills, ravines, but it's, it's relatively flat. And some of the grasslands of the world, some of the other prairies, you've got Central Africa, you have the savanna, Southern Africa, the veld, Eurasia, the steep steppe. So think of Mongolia, Australia, lowlands, South America, the Pampas and the Llanos. So there's quite a bit of, of prairie out there. And this kind of gives you an idea of the land mass it actually takes up. So Africa, huge areas of grassland, middle part, most of the United States, the uh, almost half, maybe not quite so much, but a big portion of it is all prairie and grasslands. So how was the Western, Midwestern prairie created? Uh, again, it was a rain shadow. And so we talked about rain shadows in in the uh, site analysis class with my rain shadow model. And, and so it was just, it was just droughty. It was just dry. The, the rain skipped over the prairie and it still does to this day. It just goes over the top of us. And drought persists. Um, plants have to become tolerant or, or they just, uh, they just go away. So they, they've learned to tolerate drought Um, because, because the drought, um, constant drought, trees and shrubs really don't get a foothold. And then, of course, a lightning strike or fireworks nowadays uh, is all it takes. And that's how, that's how prairie maintains itself is with that fire, occasional fire uh, does take out the trees and shrubs. Presence of large herbivores, these guys. And... They, they'll eat anything. So antelope, deer, elk. And, and that was another thing that kept the trees at bay is these guys would come along and, and, and eat them. So anyone who lives on the prairie and, and you're in an area with antelope or elk or deer, you know, it's a constant battle and they'll eat the bark off your trees. They'll strip it in a heartbeat. And, and so trees just never really had a chance to survive these guys. Horses, horses are, are also really hard on the landscape and they'll, they'll strip the bark off a tree in, in a heartbeat. So will, so will goats and um, the sheep, not so much, but they'll nibble all the leaves off hard on the tree. So again, uh, extended periods of drought, short growing season. Well, we all know that we all, <laughs> we all live this one. The wind, wind used to be a lot worse than what it is now. Uh, if you ever get a chance to listen to Don Day from Day Weather, he does an amazing program on weather and weather over the time of history and how weather has changed. And it was, the wind was a lot worse several hundred years ago. So we're, we're happy it's, it's 
uh, not quite so bad anymore. And, and so the prairie's also been divided into different types. And it's, the division is based on the height of the grass. So back east, Kansas area, Missouri, you have the tall grass prairie. And if you've ever been through a tall grass prairie, it's, it's amazing. It's six feet tall. You disappear in it. Um, then you go up towards the mixed grass or mid grass. And so that's shorter, shorter being like four feet tall. So it's, it's a little bit less, but it's um, got a little bit height in it, a little bit low growing grasses. And then you have the short grass prairie and that really describes us and our prairie. So you'll find grass anywhere from two inches tall to 18 inches. A really, really good year. You might see the grass get up to about two feet in height. And, and at two feet in height really is the, the seed head that has sprung up and gone above the leaf blades. And so the grass blades themselves never get very tall. Maybe on your cool season grasses, you're going to see a foot on a good year, but it's that seed head that makes that appearance that it's taller. And then also it's broken down again by soil type. So Nebraska, the sand hills of Nebraska, that's, that's a very well known area of uh, both water and the water filtration rate is phenomenal. Um, the pothole region of Nebraska is incorporated into the sand hills. And then you've got the black land prairie of, of East Texas. So this is what it looks like on a map. And you can see we're number three here. And yep, there we go. So it ranges quite a ways. It goes up into, into Canada and all the way down into New Mexico, parts of Texas. So it's quite a huge range for this short grass prairie that we're on. <clears throat> My coworker here is kind of pesty. So here's kind of the sad statistics. Less than 1% of the tall grass prairie remains. I was in Wisconsin a number of years ago and there was a little tiny pocket park and there was one acre of tall grass prairie in this little pocket gar park. It was just kind of sad, but 1%. About 24% of the mixed grass prairie is still intact. Um, but again, it's been converted into farmland. And then the short grass prairie, we still have about 18% of it left, but a lot of it's been heavily impacted by, by grazing and domestic, domestic livestock in particular. Most ranchers, most Western ranchers out here really try to be very mindful of this and that we have a short growing season and low water. And so they, they really try to do rotational grazing and not graze it down to the dirt um, it's hard not to, and in a drought year, it really makes it very challenging for them. So here in Laramie County, we've got, um, I've seen some tall grass areas. Uh, I've seen, I've seen some down in Fort Collins, the Fort Collins area, but mostly short grass prairie throughout the rest of the county and uh, some tall grass prairies in, in the wetter part. So this tall grass needs more, much more moisture. So the grasses in general, sod formers and some bunch grasses. So the sod formers are going to be, you know, think of like your bluegrass lawn, that's a sod former. And then your bunch grasses, that's going to be like crested wheat. So they're um, different, they grow differently, they behave differently. And the bunch grasses, think of like your ornamental grasses. So they grow in a clump. <laughs> If you're out on a prairie, it's something that you trip over. You know, that's a clump, a bunch of grass. And then they've divided it into cool season, which they refer to as C3 versus warm season, which they call C4 grasses. And it's these C3 grasses, the cool season grasses that are gonna be really what holds our prairie together 
and it's what or wildlife needs the birds need um, it's also a way to mitigate some of the wildlife that you don't want so the cool season grasses they're what start growing in late february they break dormancy you'll start seeing everything green up depending upon how much moisture we get determines how much they grow and then your c4 grasses or your warm season grasses these are the guys that take over when the cool season grasses kind of go dormant in the heat so your warm season grasses your blue grandma your buffalo grass those come to life starting in june july and they'll green up but they never grow very tall they're they're like two inches and then they have little curly leaf blades and then they send up a seed stalk and and on the blue grandma they'll send up a seed stalk that's maybe 10 inches maybe in a good year so they never get very tall they they're good for grazing to a limited extent but there's never much forage available to an animal uh, unless it's like a um, antelope or a deer where they can they can continue to move on so it's your c3 your cool season grasses that really are you know if you look at my screen behind me that was taken in the spring and that's all cool season grasses that are greening up so these grasses have all got some kind of interesting adaptations to deal with life on the prairie and so their leaves are going to be smaller and narrower and that reduces exposure to <laughs> to the wind and to the sun the heat um, hail everything and then the leaves are often going to be fuzzy so if you if you grab a hold of them and you and you feel them the underside of them is going to be fuzzy and so that slows the rate of transpiration and if it's on the top of the leaf it's going to reflect solar radiation so it keeps that leaf cooler and again early growth period when the moisture is available in your cool season grass deep deep rooted six feet deep when it's not mowed or grazed so it's it holds the soil it holds the moisture it helps it helps move that ground water that surface water to the ground and it helps it helps it go down so about 75 cent percent of the grassland biomass occurs below the surface so when you look at what's above ground, you're only seeing a small portion of what's actually happening below the surface, what you can't see. And it's, it's all this below ground biomass, think of, of roots primarily, that are really holding that energy, that soil, they're, hold, they're taking the energy down so that that plant can come back again next spring or later in the fall when it starts to cool and we get more moisture and they start to green up again. In the fall, there's not much regrowth. And so none of these grasses, if you mow it, everyone who's mowed their prairie, you probably notice that it really never comes back. You know, it's going to stay small. And then if you go back and you mow it again, you're really um, draining the energy out of that. So when that happens and you end up with a loss of those really desirable grass species. You also lose a lot of your wildflowers when you do that. And that grass will eventually die. The roots die off, um, the grass itself dies. So now you're dealing with, with uh, wind and water erosion and especially the, 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 uh, the soil. Yeah, April, go ahead. Um, in the little brochure that you sent out in the email today, it said to mow the prairie within a certain uh, distance of your home and any fencing. And I was wondering what what the importance of mowing around structures and fencing is. Okay, so in that brochure I sent out, <laughs> When people move out to the prairie, they take their lawnmowers with them and they just, they, they've got to mow. It's, it's like recreational or sports, sports mowing. 
And so the less you mow, the better. But what I would encourage is to mow around a building or mow around your house and just, just for aesthetics and someplace for the kids to play or be. And then a mow along the fence line helps keep, <laughs> it helps keep your neighbor's horses from leaning on the fence and, and reaching over and eating your grass because usually it's better on the other side of the fence. So that's really what that's all about is just kind of mitigate the, the neighbor's horses. And I've got some great pictures of that. <laughs> A lot of times right along the fence line, weeds will grow more because it's a little bit more protected. And so, you know, I'm not a pro, pro more the prairie or overgraze the prairie person by any stretch. But if you've got to mow, mow around the house and mow your fence line. So here's what this looks like <laughs> on these cool season or C3 grasses. And again, this, this root, mass area will go down six feet, six feet deep, holds the soil, holds the moisture. This area is going to stay green. The grass falls, you know, in the winter, in the spring, the grass will fall over. It covers the ground. It acts as a ground cover. And that helps keep the soil moist also. Um, Yes. Um, okay, how come I don't see a prairie section in the five pound book? I, I don't know. I've been trying to get that in there for years. It's It should be there. Uh, Wyoming is a very rural state and we need to know how to take care of the prairie. And we can't assume that everybody lives in town or that in town people are gonna stay in town because the lure of living on the land is huge. And, and yes, I will recommend some seeds. Um, probably the best thing to do is I'll send an email out with my recommendations. But anyway, when you mow this grass and, and these, these cool season grasses are your wheat grasses, um, your wild rice and a whole bunch of other cool grass species that send down these huge deep roots in the, the winter and spring, they fall over, they, they cover the ground, they act as a natural ground cover and natural protector of the soil. But when it's mowed or grades, you lose that ground cover because the wind just, just scoops it out, blows it away. And then the root system, this biomass, for whatever reason, dies back. And so it stays if you mow this down to three inches, you're gonna have maybe three or six inches worth of root mass in the soil. And if something else comes along and eats it, this plant will die because it can't compete and it can't deal with the excessive drought. There's not enough root system there, not enough moisture there. It's hot. The research coming out of, out of the Western universities, whether it's the University of Wyoming or Montana or Idaho, Nevada, take your pick. All of them have concluded through research that when this ground is exposed, it can be 20 degrees hotter and the surrounding environment is going to be in hot, be hotter. So this cool season grass that likes it in the 40s, 50s, and 60s is just going to, it's just going to die. And so what replaces it are going to be your weeds and your warm season grass, which is not as desirable. Okay, <laughs> so I feel like this whole prairie lecture, I get on my soapbox. This is kind of my soap, one of my soapbox lectures. So number of acres, it's acres per animal. If you go back east, it's animals per acre because they can get away with it because they got more moisture. But in the Western United States, it's always gonna be acres per animal. And so those acres, it's going to vary from, from month to month, and it might even vary week to week, especially when we get into July and August and September, because we don't have the moisture to keep that grass green and growing. And so we can go from being, being nice and wet and, and moist and having good green grass, like in the screen behind me, to a, a week later, we're brown. And so we can go into a drought very, very quickly out here. 
we typically look at, at acres per animal is 35 to 40 acres per animal unit. And an animal unit is a cow-calf pair. So a mama cow with her calf or a horse or six sheep or six goats. Goats really are browsers, not grazers. So goats have their head heads up and, and they like to eat things that are eye level. So they're really not, not grazers, but we force them to do that. But plan on 35 to 40 acres per animal unit without damaging the prairie. Now you can rotate your grazing. If you're on 40 acres, you can rotate your grazing so that you don't, you can have a half a dozen horses and not hurt your prairie. But you've got to have really tight control and, and make sure that those horses don't eat everything in sight. And so that means you're going to have to supplement feed. Okay. So approximate grazing lengths and regrowth periods. And so when you look at this, you can see that the regrowth period really is long. The spring is, is the least desirable time for you to put your horses or your cattle or your sheep out on the prairie. And so I'm always holding them back until till late June, if I can. And they usually try to escape buggers. But you only want to graze four to five days in the spring. And, and the reason for this is that grass is trying to grow. And as it's growing, it's also putting out a seed head or seed stalk. And it takes that, that energy it takes to put out that seed head is like 20% of the stored energy in the root system. So it's a huge cost to that plant to put out a seed head. And if an animal comes along and grazes that off, well, that plant is gonna go try to remake another seed head because it really wants to put out seed to ensure that it's going to have future generations of that grass. So it takes a lot of energy and I encourage people to keep their animals off in the spring for that reason and also because you have a lot of, of native prairie birds and a lot of prairie wildlife that depends on that spring grass and the height of that grass for nesting reasons. And there's, I think there's six different prairie ground nesting birds in Wyoming. You've got the horned lark, the meadow lark, the lark bunting, the killdeer, and there's a couple others. Um, Audubon Society um, can help you out on that one. But you can see the grass regrowth period is, is two weeks. It takes two weeks for that grass to come back. And so our growing season being as short as it is and tight, that's, that's a huge cost in a, to the grass and it's hard for it to come back. And if we're dry in the spring, there may not be any regrowth. And I, I've been out here long enough now, I've seen springs with where nothing greened up, it was brown. And so there is no regrowth. So then you get into the summer. And so you finally, you know, let those critters out. It's the 4th of July and you say, God, okay, finally go out there and graze. And now you're looking at really a 10 day rotation and it's gonna take three to four weeks for that grass to regrow if there's enough moisture. So it's always that conundrum of if there's enough moisture for regrowth. Late summer, I don't even plan on regrowth for late summer. We're talking 45 days. We don't have enough of a season for 45 days. So you really have to be very mindful on how you graze and what you graze and when. So it's, it, it, you, need to, you need to keep a special calendar just for your grazing and, and knowing how to be able to do that rotation without hurting the prairie. Okay. So, <laughs> so this is what I'm talking about, mowing along your fence. This is out in my area. This side, this barren side was overgrazed with horses. The horses ran out of pasture, obviously. They've leaned on the fence and they've grazed the other side of the fence at the expense of the fence. This, if this was mine, I would be, and I have, I've gone back out because my neighbors have horses that have done this to me, 
fix the fence and I put in barbed wire, several strands of barbed wire to discourage the horses from doing that. So it's an expense to me. Uh, I'm not happy about it. And I have mowed my fence line right along and through here, right along and through here to prevent my neighbor's horses from wrecking my fence. This has been, it's been five years since they pulled the horses off. It is, they haven't gone back in and re, the new owners haven't reseeded. They haven't done anything really. A lot of weeds, a lot of warm season grasses because that's the only thing that's really in there. That's all what you're looking at is just warm season grasses that have been grazed to the ground. I'm not, after five years, I'm still not seeing cool season grasses, your wheat grasses coming back in. So this tall stuff over here, this is all your wheat grass. And you can see the tall grass is holding the snow. It's banking the moisture. And so come spring, there's gonna be more moisture here for this grass to grow. It's not a fire hazard, that's urban myth. It's not a fire hazard because there's so much moisture down in here and, and the grass is shading the soil. It's holding the soil in. And so you're gonna have less of a fire hazard. It's also gonna be cooler by a good 20 degrees. And so even if this catches on fire, you know, the warm season grasses and the weeds catch on fire, it's gonna grow, It'll, the fire will put out about right in here. So there'll be some damage to the neighbor's property, but not extensively. And that's just because they've, they've left the prairie alone. Best thing in the world, leave the prairie alone. Fewer weeds, fewer problems. You know, by all means, if you have animals, graze it, but graze it smartly. Okay. Okay, we talked about blue grandma. We've talked about buffalo grass, buffalo grass seed, and blue grandma, really expensive, $16 a pound. It's hard to harvest. It's inconsistent in harvesting. It's persnickety in trying to get it started. The buffalo grass is, is in a little capsule. And so in that capsule are several seeds, maybe four or five seeds. And so the, the moisture has to break down that seed capsule so that the little seeds can germinate. And so it takes quite a bit of, it takes a wet spring to get buffalo grass to germinate. Okay, Blue Grandma, love this stuff. I think it's gorgeous. In the, in the uh, horticulture industry, they have, um, of course, gotten a hold of this grass and made it into ornamental grass and have hybridized it. And so now you can buy it so that it gets like two feet tall, three feet tall as an ornamental in your in your landscape at home. And so very cool. It's a very beautiful, it's a very pretty grass. It has like little, little fuzzy eyelashes. So this is how you identify it, these little fuzzy eyelashes. And it's kind of a purple, purple color to it. Very, very pretty. Buffalo grass, this stuff is tiny. It's two inches tall, never gets real, never gets real big. Um, some of the master gardeners in Cheyenne have buffalo grass lawns and it looks a little, um, looks a little more on the wild side. It still conforms to urban requirements, city of Cheyenne requirements. It doesn't ever get real tall. They don't ever mow it. They don't take care of it. It just grows. Hopefully it doesn't creep into the neighbor's lawn. But these little tiny seed capsules are very difficult to harvest. And that's, that's one reason why it's so expensive. So the mixed grass prairie. These are all natives. Needle and thread grass. If anyone grew up out in the prairie and is familiar with needle and thread grass, that's, that's a sporting one. I, I have a lot of it on my property. Western wheatgrass, beautiful. This is now the official state grass of Wyoming and it has a beautiful heathered blue color to it. It's just gorgeous. Sandberg bluegrass, um, 
beetle leaf sedge. Sedge has got edges, it's, so it's a little rougher. Um, June grass, beautiful. Um, doesn't get very tall, kind of sporadic. And this, it's, um, the seed heads are look like a bottle brush and it's golden colored, it's, it just glows. And then Indian rice grass, which is kind of feathery and fairy like. So needle and thread grass. And this, if you can see this right here, this all has got a very sharp needle like point. So if any of you grew up with siblings that would get a hold of needle and thread grass, you've been poked by it. And the it is native. The downside of it is that it can get into um, the the coats of dogs or horse on horses. Um, my sheep graze it and they come out with these little curly things on them and they do not like him being pulled off of them. But it is native and it is um, it is a sod former, not not very aggressive, but it is a sod former. Western wheatgrass, sorry, I don't have a better picture of it. Um, Sandberg bluegrass. Um, I don't expect you guys to remember this. this is trying to identify grass and it is extremely difficult, tedious, tedious. I have big books on grass identification. I, um, Needle leaf sedge does not get very tall, a couple inches. It's got this kind of funky little seed head on top of it. And the edges again, um, sedges have edges and grasses are gonna be smooth, rounded. Prairie June grass, these seed heads uh, just, I've got a picture of it and I couldn't find it. And I just wanted to put that in tonight, a better picture of it. But it's, uh, these seed heads are, are just glow a golden color and they make a really nice uh, in the landscape, in the urban landscape, they would be a nice addition. Indian rice grass, I, I just love this stuff. And for a while there was a grower in Wyoming uh, who was growing this stuff and harvesting these little tiny seed heads and making a flower, an Indian rice grass flower. And I, very niche, tight niche market for that one. But again, a beautiful grass worth planting in, in a perennial garden. Very pretty. Okay, water. I'm not going to talk a lot about water. Cheryl covered um, quite a bit of water is complicated. Water is very complicated. Um, we've got on, on my property here, we have um, well rights that go back to 1947, and then we've got surface water rights that go back to uh, territorial, pre-statehood territorial. And, and I truly now understand the, the old Western saying about, you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. It's very true today, 100, 150 years later, it's still very true. So the water law in Wyoming, the state owns the water and it's got to be permitted. So whether you get a well or however you use it, it's got to be permitted. So if there's an irrigation ditch that runs through your property, it's not, it's not your water. All you can do is watch it go by and all the water is appropriated. So, so the state owns that water until it gets to the end user. And then when it gets to the end user, it belongs to them. So it's, it, the water law is a little complicated. It's a little touchy. And first and first and right, um, first in time, first and right. So the person with the oldest water rights wins. Uh, domestic groundwater. Uh, domestic and stock water is limited to 25 gallons per minute. I've, I've seen wells where 25 gallons per minute would be a happy thing, but you get up higher into the foothills and 25 gallons per minute doesn't happen. Um, you can, um, 
according to the state law, you can irrigate an acre of, of land. I, I'm not sure what that would look like. I had there was someone out here in my area that dug up a big area of his prairie and put in a pond and got it permitted. So his dogs could go swim in it. <laughs> that was crazy use of it. Um, commercial uses include greenhouses, businesses growing for market, an additional permit requirement. I don't think they charge anything for it, but water law. Uh, they, ha they have finally started to permit, um, issue permits for wells. They didn't, that was kind of a frontier. There was no permitting on the wells. They finally have done that. Um, so this was put in in November of 2004, 20 feet from a property line, 100 feet from a leach field. And proper construction can be important quality and quantity of water produced. So make sure you get a good well driller and ask them lots of questions. And, and by the way, for those of us who live out in the county and have a well, the only time your pump will go out, quit on you, is in a blizzard at Christmas. <laughs> Been there. Got more questions about the water laws and water rights. The state engineer's office um, asked for Jeremy Manley. The man is a wealth of information. I've had him teach water for me in the past. He's kind of another energizer bunny of instructors. And once he gets going on, on water and water law and wells, he's, he gets on his soapbox, but he's a wealth of information and worth talking to him if you've got questions about um, groundwater. Water testing, you can go to the city and county health department and have them look for um, bacterial chloroforms. So you can do that twice a year, it's free. If you wanna know what your water quality of, your, of the water is, that you're gonna to have to pay for. And you can take it down to CSU, they'll do that. Um, there's a lot of private labs that will also do that. And that's where you want to know what the nitrates and nitrites are in your water. You want to know what the um, hardness of the water is, the, um, the EC, the salt level, very important, the pH, two very important things along with nitrates, nitrites. So you can, you can get your water tested and find out all sorts of information about it. And then go to the state engineer's office if you have questions about how to mitigate some of the problems. Fencing. <laughs> Here's another, another fun thing of living on the prairie is fencing. The Wyoming does have a fencing statute with minimum standards for constructing a fence. And it's, it's pretty loose and you can, I've, I've actually found some concrete posts on my property and I put them back into the ground. Once they're in the ground, they're, they're amazing posts for holding up a fence. But it depends on what you're, what you're raising or grazing on your property really kind of determines your fencing. I have sheep and so my fencing is, looks different. It, it's got to be different because otherwise, otherwise they, they'd make their way into town and they'd be grazing your lilacs. So you got whatever you're trying to fence in, make sure you, it's, it's a proper fencing for fencing them in. Or if you're trying to fence your neighbor's horses out, hot wire on the top of lots of bob wire. And then there's a share cost of fencing. And this is again, a state statute. So if you put in a fence, technically you can go to the other side, the other landowner and, and try to recoup 50% of your costs. That's fun. Okay, <laughs> dogs. I have four dogs. One of them is my livestock guardian dog. And so she stays 24 seven with the sheep and the cattle. And a lot of times people will come out to the prairie, they'll get a dog at the animal shelter and then let it loose. And I gotta tell you, that's a nightmare because 
there is Wyoming state statutes again to protect livestock owners. And dogs running at large are considered a public nuisance. And, and this is subsection D is actually a little bit more involved than this, a, a dog that's harassing or hazing or a dog that injures or, or is killing livestock may be killed by the owner of the livestock or his agent or any peace officer. And so the last thing any of us wanna do is have to try to find the owner of a dog and say, hey, Keep them, keep them tied up. So keep this in mind. Um, domestic dogs, if they pack up there, that's a nightmare. That is an absolute, I have lost some sheep to domestic dogs. Okay, windbreaks. <laughs> Today is a good example of, of a windbreak is a great thing to have. They increase the value of your property. Make sure that they're done right get with the conservation district, get a plan, have them put it in. It might cost a little bit more, but have them plant it for you. And it, it decreases your heating bill because it, it makes the wind go up and over, capture snow. And so that capturing the snow, again, they're banking the snow, they're banking the moisture and banking the moisture out here is just everything. Provides wildlife habitat. A lot of birds. I have foxes in mine. I have bunnies, which is why I have foxes. So, so they do provide a very important value back to your property. Okay, weeds. This is uh, here in Laramie County, and this is tumbleweeds and um, mustard, tumble mustard that is caught up in the fence. And there, if there's enough of this and we get a snowstorm, this is enough to pull this fence down. And then your livestock escapes. <laughs> so weeds, very competitive. And they grow well in spite of interference from other plants. They're very persistent. They are survivalists. They spread seed very effectively. And most of them are annuals and they're gonna return year after year. You're fighting them for a long time. Don't, don't let them get the other hand, upper hand because um, it gets expensive and difficult to try to fight them. So they can actually accumulate salt in the soil and they can raise that EC level. They can change the water table depth they can actually make the water table go deeper, increase erosion, increase wildfire, um, tumbleweeds, tumble mustard. That's a, that's a real recipe for problems. So weeds, natural methods, wind, water, animals, people. You know, you think about, you know, the weeds that get stuck on your socks or your, your pants or your shoes and, and you brush them off and yeah, just, just move the weeds. Catherine, can yeah. you say something about how weeds can increase salt in your soil and increase erosion? Yeah, so there's one in particular called um, tamarisk salt cedar. And so it actually will pull the salt out of the soil, you know, locally, and then it exudes it back, the roots exude it back into a concentrated area and that other plants just can't grow in there and um, Dalmatian toad flax has got a the roots are aliopathic and that means that that the roots exude a natural chemical herbicide that kills off the native plants like your native grasses and so now it's bare ground and that bare ground is going to be more prone to wind erosion and so the soil is going to just blow away. And so that's that's a weed that we're fighting like crazy here in Laramie County. And it's it. I'll show you pictures of it, but it looks like giant yellow snapdragons. And it's it's not native. It's it's, it's a problem. It's it's a huge problem. 
um, construction, vehicles, tillage, contaminated seeds, um, prairie seed, prairie grass seed, livestock management, all sorts of mechanical methods for, um, for weeds to, to take over. Construction is especially difficult to remediate in Wyoming. And um, I watched the pipelines go through and they're, they're doing a good job of preventing weeds from coming in and trying to hold the soil down. And I, I've talked with them on a number of occasions and, and they're really, they really do care about how the land looks when they're done putting in a pipeline. So some of this, some of the weeds that we're fighting, downy brome or cheatgrass. And this, this is a winter annual. And so it's, we talked a little bit about it the last class. It, it germinates at 46 degrees. So it, it likes it cold. And there was a student at UW that did some experiments with it and wildflower seed mixes. And so he took the whole wildflower seed mix, took it to 46 degrees, got everything moist to germinate. The cheatgrass germinated, the downy brome germinated at 46 degrees, the wildflower seeds did not. And then he dried everything out thinking, okay, now I've killed, theoretically, I should be killing the cheatgrass, the downy brome. So he then started to germinate the, the wildflower seeds and the downy brome has survived germination, drought, and then being rehydrated it. 7% of it survived that. And so it's a very tenacious weed. It, seeds shouldn't be able to do that. They shouldn't be able to come back after they started to germinate and been dried out. Normally that kills them, but downy brome survived that. So the time to control it is in the fall, which again seems to be kind of counterintuitive, but the time timing on this is kind of critical. So at the end of October, first part of November is when you go in and, and so again, this has to be a chemical application and the, and the chemical herbicide is plateau. You can get it at, at Laramie County Weed and Pass. Again, they'll cost share with you. You spray it in the fall and, and it might take a couple years to control this because the seed bank is extensive. And if, it, if downy brome catches on fire, and because it goes dormant, it goes, dries out in June. And so by July and August, it is a fire hazard. And you can see in this picture here, it's, it's a golden brown. It, it's not even really a pretty golden brown. I, I, it gets stuck, in, the seeds get stuck in your socks and stuck in dog's fur. And it's just kind of a nasty character but it will catch on fire and burn and it will be the first one to re-germinate and come back after a fire. So trying to control this one with fire is, doesn't work either. And, and you would think, God, I just burn it all out. But the seed bank is, is so extensive and a grass fire isn't, is not hot, not like a forest fire. And so a grass fire is going to be right around 600 degrees, but it's, it stays pretty much at the surface and above. And so it doesn't really get to that seed bank. And so that's why it's the first one to come back and it outcompetes all your native grasses. So it's, it's just very, it, very difficult. You can take, <laughs> you can carefully take Roundup to it and spot spray it. And I've certainly controlled it in, in some of my, garden areas with Roundup and that will take it out. And then you can go back in and reseed fairly soon. But if you've got acreage, you can't do that. It's just not cost effective. So this is a really tough one. And you, um, the research station up at Lingle, they've done a lot of experimenting with grazing it and spraying it and timing on it. And I've, I haven't seen anything really conclusive in any of the test pots. So it, it's challenging. So this is one 
um, try not to let that get out of control. Okay, field bindweed. Oh, this is just persistence. <laughs> this is just this is just persistence. And you got to pull it, you got to spray it, you got to pull it, you got to spray it. And it's just it, there's no magic bullet for this this one. It's just it's just persistent. The root system. You know what a bowl of spaghetti looks like? Well, that's what the root system looks like underground. It's just that extensive. I have seen bindweed go underneath an asphalt road, a 40 foot wide asphalt road and come up on the other side. And I've seen it push through the asphalt. And it's just, it is persistence, just persistence. Okay, Dalmatian toad flax. And this is one <laughs> I've been, trying to educate people on since 2010 and it seems like an uphill fight on it and there was one year where it really got out of control it's it has it's a perennial and it has underground rhizomes it's very very extensive and so again timing of control on this is everything and, it, and this is this is true with all your weeds. Timing is, is so important. This is one you can spray it when it's blooming. You can spray it when it's um, after the first frost. So sometime in September or October when we get that first frost, then you go out and you spray it. Same thing with thistle. So, so if we put thistle and Dalmatian toad flax together, the control methods are going to be very similar and along with the timing and so with thistle when it's blooming because it's very vulnerable it's it's sending a lot of energy out to bloom blooming is at a huge cost to a plant so if you can hit it with something like 2,4-D um, you can go to weed and pest if you got a big spot of it um, milestone you can there's a couple that you can blend together, work with weed and pest on that one. And so when it's blooming, so thistle and Dalmatian teleflas, when it's blooming and in the fall after the first frost. And there's, and it's persistence. I've got thistle down around, uh, Crow Creek runs through my property. And so I've got some thistle down along the creek and been fighting that for years. I thought I had a control on it. and Lo and behold, it came back this spring. I'm not happy about that. I have a little spots of Dalmatian toad flax. I do pull it. It pulling seems to be very effective. Even though it's got this very extensive underground root system pulling, it seems to really set it back. And I've pulled it in spots and I haven't seen it come back. I got some big areas that I will spray. I don't want this out of control. If Dalmatian toad flax gets out of control on your property, it will take over and you will lose any, any ability to graze an animal out there whatsoever. Again, it's, it has aleopathic properties at the roots. So it has a natural herbicide that kills off competitors like your native grass. And Dalmatian toad flax has um, natural alkaloids. And so those alkaloids um, almost always go after the liver. And I've seen horses eat the tops off of them, eat the flowers because they're sweet. But you certainly want, don't want to maintain that. And then of course, there's absolutely no, no value to the wildlife. You know, you'll see some bees at it, but it'll be like bumblebees. And so there's, there's, no, there's no real value to this one. It doesn't contribute anything. Do you back. have a picture of this one, Catherine? Yep. Yep. Here it is. Is there a picture of the Oh, great. Yep. Yep. Like I said, it looks like yellow snapdragons. And it can get tall. It can get three feet, four feet tall. This this just shoots way up. Quarter million, a quarter million seeds in this plant alone. And, and so that's why, yeah. Is that the Dalmatian toad flax? Yes. Yes. Yep. Is there um, nectar in the toad flax like there is a regular snapdragon? There's a little bit of a reward 
and I've certainly seen bumblebees on this, but it takes a big bee like a bumblebee to pry those petals open and get down in there. It's gotta be a long tongued bee. As you can see how long this nectar area is. Where's my cursor? Ah, where'd you go? Anyway, right there, see how long that nectary is? Uh, honeybees aren't gonna touch that. They're gonna, they might chew this open, but they're not going to, they can't get in there to, to get to the nectar of the pollen. So this takes a big bee. This takes a, a bumblebee to do that. So they don't offer anything back to the native bees, which are smaller. And, and so there's no, there's no benefit to them. And this is what it looks like in the spring when it's coming up. <laughs> I, can, I can spot this stuff going 70 miles an hour down the interstate. And so it makes me crazy. And if I walk your property, I, I'll find it and I'll point it out and I'll pull it and I'll hand it to you. So you know. But this, don't let this get away on your property. You are controlling it and reclaiming it. You're looking at three to five years of, of that long of a battle. Okay, leafy spurge. Um, again, aleopathic, deep root system, perennial. This is what this looks like. And this is along the base. Effie Warren base has a, has a big problem with this and they're not controlling it. And they, and they, I don't know why they're not controlling it, but they're not. And so it, it works its way downstream into the city of Cheyenne. And so the city of Cheyenne has been fighting this for, for 40 years. And so when you see the goats out grazing Crow Creek, that's, that's what they're trying to control leafy spurge. Um, so when you spray, does it kill the other things growing on your property? Spot spray. You don't have to spray everything, but spot spray. So you can get like a little spray tank, little pump spray tank, and just go out and spot spray. You don't have to spray everything. So, so know what you're going after, unless it's so bad that you have, you have no option. And I have a small amount of toad flax. Is pulling it an effective means to eliminate it? I've pulled mine. I, when I find it, I'll try to pull it. I've got one patch now that's kind of gotten away from me. So I'll have to spray it. But pulling it, pulling it can be effective. I don't like to spray. I don't want to use herbicides if I don't have to. So I will, I will pull. Not my favorite task. Catherine, you mentioned pull and spray. I mean, if you're going to use a combination of those techniques, do you pull first and then spray where you pulled it out of or spray first and then pull? Okay. So one method or the other. And and, and trying to blend these methods, usually I, I've seen people kind of really get it wrong. So if you're going to spray, just spray. Don't mow it, just spray it. If you're gonna pull, pull it, but don't spray it. <laughs> so one or the other, but usually they don't blend well. Okay, Russian thistle. This is what this stuff looks like when it's, when it's just um, coming up in the spring. So my dad's wheat farmer pulls then burns. Um, so burning actually works, and I can't imagine being a wheat farmer and trying to pull weeds, but um, uh, on, a, on a scale of, and I've burned my prairie in the past, and, and again, my husband with a flamethrower is, is, not, is not a good thing. <laughs> So we haven't burned the prairie in a long time. Kind of getting to the point where I should, don't want to. So I'm going to use other methods instead. Um, burning is, is, that does some incredible things for the prairie, very positive things for the prairie. It does get rid of a lot of your annual weeds, except cheatgrass. And it, it's very regenerative. It does put a lot of minerals back into the soil. 
um, as long as you do it at a time when the wind doesn't blow all that away, the good stuff away. But fire is not a bad thing. Anyway, Russian thistle. Um, so the picture at the top here, this is what it looks like in a spring. It looks like, like grass, but if you reach down and you touch it, it's, it's leathery. It, it's, it's tough and kind of rubbery and leather-like. And if you, if you can spot it, um, oh, control stickers, yeah. Um, you can kind of mitigate it, but this is one that, again, Russian thistle doesn't belong here. 20,000 to 50,000 seeds. And when that plant gets to mature size and it breaks off and it tumbles, you know, Russian thistle is your tumbleweed. You know, so in those old Westerns and you see the tumbleweed rolling by, probably not. They probably didn't exist back then, but, but it looks good in a Western. <laughs> and, but they're spreading seeds as they tumble. So it's, it's not ever a good thing. This is what it looks like as a mature plant. It's big, it can get three feet tall, it gets huge. And they'll tumble and they get stuck in your fences. They, I've, I've run them over going down the road. It, it, they're just nasty. And um, contact dermatitis. So you don't ever wanna stick your hand down in here because there's little, there's little thorns on those things and they'll braid your arm and, and cause all sorts of problems. Um, allergic reaction in people in the summer. Yeah, I, I don't have problems with it, but some people can be very sensitive to it. Okay, Larkspur. This is um, native. This is a native plant. It's toxic. All parts of this plant are poisonous. It's a very, very pretty plant. It's really, um, it's really something that cattle producers have got to be very mindful of and watch, watch for. I'm, I have some of it on my property, and this is what it looks like. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful plant. It's toxic. It's deadly to cattle, absolutely deadly to cattle. A fourth of a pound of larkspur will kill a 1,200 pound cow in 48 hours. And there's no known antidote for it. You can call the vet, the vet can try to help you. Um, but I, I've gotten phone calls from livestock producers that just, just break your heart. And I'll go out and identify it. I was coming home one day and drove by my neighbor's place. And he's got, I watching the larkspur on his property and drove by and he had thrown a couple dozen Corenti cattle out there. And the Corentis are the, are the ones with the big, big horns on them that go way out and they use them for roping. And almost always you lease those cattle. And so that would have been pretty expensive. And I go up to his door, I knock on his door, give him my business card. I say, you know, you've got Larkspur out there. And he just sort of looks at me and goes, no, what is, what is Larkspur? <laughs> so if you live on the prairie, you, you really, and you want to raise livestock because, you know, you want to feed your family and that makes sense, but, but no, but know what's toxic and what's not. And so I have, I go around and I pull this. It's, it's, it's native, it's, it's kind of sad, I have to pull it, but I don't want my cattle eating it either. So if you live on a little plot uh, close to town, that's just outside of town, no. you know, like I do, and you're not raising any kind of animals, does it matter if you have larkspur? No, if you're not raising, if you don't have cattle, and or sheep or horses, enjoy it. By all means, it's beautiful. Enjoy them. Yeah. Don't what about don't domestic put it in your animals salad. like dogs and cats? No, they won't eat it. No. Horses will will eat it, but it takes like twenty pounds to make a horse sick. You know, but you still don't want to go there. Again, it's native, won't hurt your, yeah, dogs and cats will leave it alone. Uh, 
Um, again, larkspur, no antidote. And if a, if a vet can get to the animal in time to treat it, the, the treatment's almost as toxic as the larkspur. Okay, native grass furry forbs. So forbs, a lot of times you'll hear um, the wildlife people talk about forbs, and it's just a term for weeds and wildflowers. But, but usually it's native weeds and native wildflowers. And so a lot of times you'll see antelope hanging out in someone's wheat field and they'll nibble some of the wheat, but they're really going after, well, antelope really want the wildflowers and, and the weeds more than they want wheat. Um, prickly pear, I wish I had better pictures of this. Um, Globe mallow. I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit because um, I've got a, another section in here of um, wildflowers, prairie wildflowers, and the pictures are infinitesimally better. Small mammals and rodents, rabbits. Oh my gosh, I get a lot of calls about rabbits. And usually these little guys are in, in town and someone's domesticated yard with their bluegrass and they're grazing the bluegrass and eating shrubs and um, causing damage. And so in town, they're harder to control. You can put up fencing for them, which doesn't ever look nice. And then uh, if you've got a cat or your neighbors have cats that wander, they'll control the rabbits. Dogs certainly will chase them off. Although I have these guys out at my property and my dogs, four dogs, just look at the rabbits and we'll give kind of a token chase and the rabbits will kind of give a token run. And then they, they both stop and look at each other like, yeah, that was worthless. So rabbits prefer some type of cover. So they're, they like shrubbery, they like the trees, they like, they, sadly, they like your windbreak. And that's where most of mine hang out is in the windbreak. The damage is going to be at a 45 degree angle. So it's going to be a sharp cut. And they like your garden. They like the vegetables in your garden, flowers and shrubs. And if you're out in the county, if you're out in the prairie, don't mow. This is going to discourage them. And so most of these, this wildlife that you don't want, like the rabbits and the hares, yeah, rabbits eat all my tulips before they open. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, deer will eat your tulips too. I think antelope will eat tulips. Sorry. Um, but mowing, so with your jackrabbits and your hares, your cottontail bunnies, prairie dogs, the more you mow the prairie, the more of these guys you will have. And so I'm going to skip ahead. There's the damage caused by a cottontail bunny. That's a way to protect your trees from both prairie, um, from hares and cottontails. Hares, big, long, giant ears, they're huge. <laughs> they're absolutely huge. Even my, even my dogs kind of look at them and go, yeah, I'm messing with that. Um, so again, don't mow, they, and so I'm going to jump ahead to prairie dogs. Prairie dogs, your, your cottontails and your, your jackrabbits, they all want to be able to have a view. They want to see the predator coming. They want to see that hawk, the, the eagle. They want to see the fox, the coyote. They want to be able to have a view. And and so they can see the predator coming and they can escape. If they can't see the predator coming, then they're going to, they're going to leave. They're going to go find some place where it's safer for them. And if you let your grass get tall, they can't see over it. And they're going to go to your neighbor who mows or is overgrazed and they're going to hang out there. And there's some really good examples of that in some of the subdivisions close to town that have mowed their prairie and they've got just lots of prairie dog holes. And once you get prairie dogs, 
the methods of trying to get rid of them is just very toxic. It, it's very, very toxic. So don't mow. You can try putting um, visual barriers around the holes like straw bales or, or just um, some, sort of, some sort of creative visual barrier to discourage them. But prairie, gra prairie dog towns are extensive, extensive. And when, like I said, once you get them, boy, they're hard to get rid of, but mowing, well, in, if, you, if you want prairie dogs, gophers, rattlesnakes, then, then mow because rattles and and so I run into this is another fun one I run into um, people mow because they don't want snakes well that's a back east thing the western snakes whether it's a bull snake or a rattlesnake they again want that bare ground that's warm because they're a cold-blooded animal they need that heat from the ground to warm up so they can function. And so you'll see snakes sunbathing on rocks, bare patches of ground. That's why you see the bull snakes in the middle of the road. I have been known to stop and push bull snakes out of the road so people don't run them over. And, and they, want, they want that open. So you can discourage snakes by letting the grass get tall. And, and keep that shady and cool. You know, we talked about that. And that's how you're gonna discourage your snakes. Prairie dogs, prairie dog towns are, they're associated with black widow spiders and rattlesnakes. So when you drive by your neighbors and you see they've got prairie dog colonies, prairie dog holes, you, you can also bet there's going to be rattlesnakes and black widow spiders on that property. Not a good thing. Don't mow. Stop mowing. Let that prairie get tall. You're not creating a fire hazard. You're preventing a lot of, you're actually going to prevent a lot of fire and you're going to keep that ground cooler and reduce a lot of these problems, the, the rabbit problems and prairie dog problems. Okay. Okay, do not mow, right there, do not mow. I'm gonna get off my soapbox, <laughs> pocket gophers. Oh. So pocket gophers are a tough one because it doesn't matter if you don't mow or you mow, they, they don't care. And they're, they don't hibernate, so they're active year round. They're active at night, they're active during the day. <laughs> they leave these giant mounds. They will girdle a tree. They, they, on the other hand, they have plowed up a couple of my vegetable gardens that were hard as rocks. And I'm like, wow, that pocket gopher came in handy. And unfortunately I have, I have uh, barn cats that, that hunt them. So after they plowed up the soil, the barn cats got them. But this is what it looks like after the snow melts. So they've got these tunnels. This is pocket gopher right here. And then during the summer, this is what it looks like. So they're mounds of dirt. They are great earth movers. They're amazing earth movers, but they are just hard on trees. And this is a tree that a pocket gopher ate. They have literally eaten all the roots off of it, girdled the tree, and the tree just fell over. So these are a tough one. Um, controlling. Unfortunately, the methods of controlling these guys is again, it's, it's fairly toxic. You do, there is a gopher, pocket gopher bait that you can get from the county and put down in those pocket gopher holes. I don't like using it. It is uh, as a type of warfarin, which is a anticoagulant. So they essentially take this and they, they bleed to death. And my concern with this is other animals getting it. 
So, you know, if a fox digs it up or a cat gets it or something, that's, that's always my concern with it. So again, it's got to be very controlled on how you use it and when and where. You can dig up the holes, you can level the holes out, but it's, it's a, <laughs> they're, they're, they're a pest. Um, controls, domestic cats, foxes, owls, hawks. Uh, I've watched the hawks sit on our, our irrigation system, our center. We got a center pivot and I watched the hawks sit up there waiting for pocket gophers. You can bury fence 18 inches below the soil surface so you can get uh, hardware cloth and bury that down. Protect your trees. That's very, very effective. Least toxic method. Okay. This is the best, the best control right there for your pocket gophers, your prairie dogs, your, your bunnies is a fox. Very good control. They also go after snakes, they'll eat grasshoppers. Uh, they're, they'll eat anything. Your cat, your barn cats will eat them too, sadly. Okay, some questions. Um, so how can we get more foxes around? I, I'm starting to see more and more. It, it's kind of a balance out there. If there's a lot of coyotes, you're not going to have a lot of foxes. And then six years ago, um, mange. Uh, mange went through the whole population and just wiped out coyotes and foxes. And mange jumped to horses. It was, that was fairly unpleasant. But mange is a, a mite that lives on the skin of the animal and the mange um, uh, eats the dead hair and it also cuts the, the living hair off. And so you'll see an animal, um, a coyote or a fox or whatever, that's got patchy bare spots and that's mange. And there's a, a wormer out there called ivermectin that will control that. I don't know many people that put ivermectin out for their, for their wildlife, but that's how it's controlled. Wait, so, so sorry, one more question about the, yeah, the underground fencing. Um, Cause I know I have some signs of these gophers on my property and I haven't started planting trees yet, but it, should I be doing this for all the trees that I plant doing this hardware cloth under them? No, you don't have to. Um, I usually go around and rake the, the pocket gopher holes flat, I level them out flat. So I just harass them. And that's how I get them out of my garden. And then my, my barn cats do a number on them too. So I don't, I don't try to go to that extreme, but when you put down a windbreak, make sure that your irrigation system is on top of the weed barrier and that, and that it's not, you're not watering everything. You're just only watering the tree. And because pocket gophers like moist soil, they like excessively moist soil. So it's, it's a real balancing act with those guys. And once they get into your tree break, that's where you take the gloves off and you fight back with poisons, sadly. And that's a whole nother lecture though, really. Okay, so <laughs> open range. So the last part of this, and this is fairly quick, these are some of the wildflowers found on the prairie. It's just a sampling. And I hiked around on my property. I had, I had the time and the opportunity last spring and summer to walk around on my property and take pictures of my wildflowers. Argamone polyanthemos, prickly poppy. This is a native poppy. No, not a true poppy, but a native poppy to Wyoming, to the Western region. And it's called the prickly poppy. And it's, you see these leaves and each end has got a very sharp point on it. And this is how it deters grazing animals from eating it. It's prickly, it's pokey. The flower, on the other hand, will attract a lot of your native bees. I've seen a lot of bumblebees, native bumblebees going after this and little native bees on it. I've got some of it that's kind of just blew in. The seeds are poppy seed-like 
and it just blew in. I've got some in my perennial flower beds. It's a fun one to work around. Bloom's White from May through August. It's a short-lived perennial, so only expect to see it maybe two to three years, and it will reseed and pop up some other place. Full sun, sandy, well-drained soil, and drought tolerant. It is very drought tolerant. It, it's pretty amazing at where I see it grow and it just blooms its little heart out. Brassica rapa. This is bird seed, bird's rape mustard. And this is, is gonna have these long, not even really leaves, but long stalks on it. And then the kind of a yellow, sulfur yellow flowers on them. Uh, annual or biannual, so one year to two years. Full sun, moist, dry conditions, so it doesn't really care. <laughs> neutral to neutral <laughs> to alkaline soils containing loam, clay loam, or gravelly material. It doesn't care. It will grow anywhere. It's native. Coreopsis tinctora. This is one where when we get the right amount of moisture in the spring, it's just sort of a sea of yellow, beautiful yellow. And the, the uh, species name on it, tinctora, means that it's a dye, it's a natural dye. So I have gone out and I've collected a lot of this stuff and I've done dyes with it. And it's a, it's a yellow dye. And of course, this is a whole nother chloras, but if depending upon the mordant you use, if you use an iron mordant to it, you get this really pretty kind of a tan taupe, tanny taupe. Does that make sense? Anyway, it's pretty. Short-lived perennial, short-lived two to three years, 18 inches tall, June through September. So it'll have one huge flush of color in June and then it'll bloom sporadically. This is another plant that native bees love and will go to. This is easy to grow uh, in your own garden. So you can start it from seed, you can buy it as a plant. It's just, it's not long lived. That's, that's, the, only, that's the only downside with this guy. Sandy, well-drained soil, full sun. It, it'll grow anywhere on anything. Ergonium flavum, this is wild buckwheat. And this is if you're doing a native pollinator garden, this is a must have in a native pollinator garden. Perennial, fairly long lived. It's about 10 inches tall. And again, not picky, not picky. Loose, rocky soils, full sun, light shade, adaptable, different soil types. Don't care, not picky. Uh, yellows, pinks, creams, or whites. Predominantly yellows. Blooms June through September. So this is another great support plant for your native pollinators. Drought tolerant, good in rock gardens, native bees, butterflies. So uh, not particularly showy, but it's a good one to have. Where can we find, so the question is, where can we find seed for these native pollinators? Um, Amplewood Seed Company is the one that the Southeast Wyoming Beekeepers Association goes to. And we've got one member, Dr. David Lewis, who buys this seed in bulk. He will buy a 50 pound bag. And after the lecture, I will send you his information you can get in contact with him and uh, he puts an order in every year and it's uh it's a it gets it at a really good price really good price okay for isman aspirin this is yellow wild wallflower wallflower this is another one this is an early one this this guy will come up in in may and june and it'll just, again, this is another one that covers the whole prairie. There'll be just huge, massive drifts of the wallflower. And it gets taller and it's more compact. So it's a different type of flower. Um, 
than Coreopsis, different color really. But again, uh, native member of the mustard family. Again, it's uh, all these native wildflowers are short lived. They're going to short lived perennials. So you're always going to be either reseeding or replanting these guys. Blooms May, May to July. Full sun, open areas, well drained. It reseeds easily. That's the good news. It reseeds. Uh, again, not picky. That's the nice thing about a lot of these native plants. They're not picky. Most of them don't want to be overwatered. That's their only picky thing is, is don't overwater them. Linium lewisii. This is flax. This isn't one that, again, is native. Grows about two and a half feet tall. Um, this is not the flax that you get um, the flax seed for that's that's high in the uh, the omegas. That's a different flax. That's actually a flax that blooms yellow. And the flax that is also used for fiber is a different type of linium. But this this is a native Western linium. Uh, great in uh, pollinator gardens. I have a lot of this in my pollinator habitat and easy to grow. Does not transplant well, but you can direct seed it. And direct seeding is probably the best way to do with this one. Um, is there a key distinction between flowering weeds and wildflowers? That's um, <laughs> Depends upon how you want to look at it. There are some weeds that you definitely don't want, and those are the, the introduced non-native weeds. There's a lot of native weeds, and it just all depends upon how you want to look at that. Um, Liathrus polymorphous, hoary vetchling, and low grower, really pretty. Kind of a short blooming season, May and June, couple weeks in May and June. Flowers are pink to purple, hints of white on the bloom. They're really very, very pretty, kind of pea-shaped. Full sun, well-drained. They really make, um, they're really good in rock gardens or container gardens or, or, or crevice gardens. Low care, started from seed. Best way to do is from seed. Um, gravelly or rocky areas of the plains, so they like that well-drained soils. And so I, I'm kind of skipping ahead in this kind of because I also want to point out Oxytropus lamberti. And they, if you look at this flower, and you know, when I go out and take pictures, I'm not the best photographer. And, and I try to go out early in the morning when the wind isn't blowing, but all it takes with these guys is a little bit of a breeze and then they're blurry. But if you look at this Oxytropus, and you go back and look at the lathrus, and you look at the leaves on the plants and even the even the flower, they're kind of similar. But Oxytropus lamberti is your local weed, and this one is, is toxic. Where the vetch vetchling isn't, and the vetchling is a member of the pea family, and it actually will put nitrogen, has nitrogen capabilities of nitrogen fixation with a rhizobium bacteria and it puts it back into the soil. But the Oxytropus lamberti gets taller. It also blooms from May to July. So it has a longer blooming window. And this is one that, that you gotta be careful with horses. And, and so um, they'll eat it. Horses will eat this because it's palatable. But it grows full sun, dry to moist, doesn't care. Um, soils, rocky, hard pack, they'll, they'll grow just about anywhere. And I've got quite a bit of this on my property. I've, I, have, I have burrows from the Bureau of Land Management and they're pretty savvy animals and they, they stay away from this stuff. <laughs> okay, Leucocriminium montanium. Star lily, tiny, tiny little plant. So when I go out hiking on the prairie and I'm taking pictures, I usually have an escort. And, and so this is a, a great example of how tiny this flower is. This is, a, this is the nose of a Welsh Pembroke Corgi. 
So we're not talking a big nose, we're talking a little nose here. And so you can see this, this flower is only maybe two inches and it's uh, kind of a bulb. So it's a drought evader. It's gonna bloom. And by the end of June, it's done blooming. And then the whole plant just withers away and you're not gonna find it again. So it was really very kind of serendipitous that I actually found this. Um, again, tiny, doesn't get very tall at all. But this would be a good one to have if you've got a rock garden or a crevice garden, this would be a fun one to have in there. Mertensa, this is your bluebells, Mertensa lanceolata or Veridus. This is a member of the Borage family. And so this is another one that's gonna be really good for your native bees and native butterflies. Again, uh, gets about 12 inches tall. So this was competing a lot with some grasses. Likes moist to dry, open areas, full sun to full to light shade. So it's not, it's not picky, it's an easy keeper. Flowers are blue to blue pink, bloom May to July, and very pretty, very pretty little bluebell. Die back in the heat of summer, can be grown from seed, so it's an easy one to start. Um, you can start it in a seed flat and start it indoors, or you can just direct sow it outside. Um, so this is, <laughs> wild parsley and so there's a lot of yellow wildflowers but if you look really carefully at this there's a little native bee on this guy and so again this is a good one for your native perennial wildflower pollinator habitat gardens tiny flowers native compact perennial 12 inches tall or less and about as wide. Blooms May through June, so it's a short window, narrow window. Likes dry, open, rocky areas on the plains. Does well in rock gardens, can be grown from seed. You gotta sow the seed in the fall. It's a little, little different, a little different. I suspect you could sow it, you know, have a wildflower seed mix, sow the whole thing all together in early, early spring. Early spring is uh, March, April, early May. And the seed would probably sit there all summer and then pop up in the, and then you'd see it the next year. Was Inium tenufolium. Cool. Yes. Yeah. Okay, penstemons. Uh, over at UW, over on the west side of the Berry Biodiversity Building is a penstemon garden. And there's several dozen different types of penstemon. Penstemon, um, multitude of colors, easy to grow, anywhere from five inches to 18 inches. They can be brought, you can dig them up and propagate them by division, dividing those roots or by seed. Another great one for your native pollinators. Bumblebees love this. Uh, honeybees, not so much because it takes a, a kind of a long tongued bee for this. And then there's the American Penstemon Society. You can find them in nurseries. Over 100 species in the Rocky, Rocky Mountain region. So a lot, of, a lot of choices. Some are long lived, some are short lived. I've got a patch of penstemon that just gets bigger every year. It's great. That patch came from another garden. So they're they're easy to transplant. Thermopsis rambofolia. This is prairie buffalo pea. And I typically see this growing alongside the roads where the it's been disturbed, where the, the road base has been disturbed along kind of like the borrow ditch area. Underground rhizomes form big patches. Yellow flowers grow above the leaves May through August. So this kind of blooms, has a flush in May and then it kind of recurs um, off and on. Very drought tolerant, works well in perennial flower beds. Rumex venosus, this is viney dock. 
And so this is one that kind of crosses the line. And I'm not really sure if this is, you know, you either like this or you don't. You either look at this as a weed. Or you look at this as, oh, it's kind of pretty. I mean, it's really very pretty, kind of peachy orange color. So, but this one, this one can cross the line because it can, it can kind of take over, it can be aggressive. And so this could be one that you can say, oh, this is a weed and you can get rid of it. You can pull it, uh, you, can, you can spray it, you can mow it. Uh, good for holding sandy banks. You can, you can use it in dry flower arrangements. So it, it can be a multitasker. Viola nuttiella, yellow prairie violet. So again, I, I was it was really kind of one of those serendipitous things where I came across this tiny, very tiny, maybe maybe three inches above the ground. The leaves are huge, the flowers tiny, but again, it's it's a native viola found throughout the Rocky Mountain region. It does like it a little bit. Um, Oh, a little bit more sunny. It's kind of an unusual viola, and that it likes um, it likes it dry and and hot. That's unusual. Most violas are are shade lovers and cool, moist soil. So this is this guy kind of changes the rules a little bit. Predominantly, gosh, I found this in May, May June. And when I went back in July, I couldn't find it again. So it was a brief, brief visitor. So <laughs> that's that's the end of my uh, my uh, my story tonight. And so so hopefully you aren't aren't like this cat. <laughs> and, um, any any questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah, Catherine, this is Melinda. Up in Platte County, where they've been working on the roads and they disturbed all the dirt next to the roads, all of a sudden these flowers, they must have seeded them, but all of a sudden these flowers are coming up and they're like three feet tall, four feet tall. And I've noticed that they spread like crazy and all of a sudden we have them close to the lake where we have never seen them before. They're yellow. And I, I just arbitrarily said, oh, they must be yellow mustard, which I don't know what it is, but what do you think they are using? Because I believe that the road builders are seeding with it. That's a tough one. If you can get, you know, next, when they start to bloom, when they come up next spring, summer, take pictures, send them to me. Because okay. off the top of my head, I don't know. Okay. Uh, normally, if they're putting wildflowers into a seed mix, they're going to try to keep it to the native wildflowers and not right. introduce species. So I, I'd almost suspect that they've introduced a weed or, or exposed enough soil that the weeds have now taken over. I'll, I'll take could a mustard. Could be they are, mustard. They're everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's unfortunate. Okay. Are there wildflowers that should be avoided in city gardens? Can't think of any. Go for it. Okay, yucca plants. So <laughs> yucca plants are, are tenacious and they're gonna grow in, in soil that's a little more alkaline, a little more um, compacted, a little bit more dry. And they have they have a root that goes to China. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's, it's a root that's like six feet deep or, or deeper. And so trying to eliminate yucca is daunting. You can, you can burn them out, you can cut them out, you can, you can wrap them up with a chain and try to yank them out and they will come back. All it takes is just a little bit of, of root like this and they'll grow back from that. So trying to control them is really difficult, but they're, they're serve a purpose and that they do provide shelter for wildlife. They will hold the snow and sometimes they're the only thing there that's holding the snow and banking it. And so they're, they're, they're helping that moisture level 
go deeper into the soil. I know that, you know, I've trying to go through a patch of yucca is difficult because they're spiny and they're, they're pokey. I've got some yucca on my property. I just, I leave it alone. I just really, yeah, it depends on what you're trying to do on that property, but trying to eliminate it is, you're, you're looking at a long battle, a really long battle. And, and Rick, maybe sometime I'll, I can go out to your property and we can look at it and see what's going on, but trying to eliminate yucca is, that, that's a career. Okay, how about some non-clumping yarrow or feverfew or some shastas? Well, there's yarrow that's native to the prairie and there's a um, Achelia millifolia that's, that's creeping, it'll creep along and form a dense mat, doesn't get very tall, maybe, maybe 10 inches. And so that's, that's a native and pollinators love it. Fever few shastas. Um, there's some new shasta varieties out that are that don't offer anything to pollinators. Uh, they're no pollen, no no nectar. So just kind of be careful with what variety you get. And a lot of times when you get into these new cultivars, they're pretty, they're beautiful, but they they're not multitaskers. They look great in an arrangement, and that's it. Fever few, fever few will jump. That's a nice herb. That'll that'll get going. You can make teas out of fever few, and that's a fun one. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Threw a lot at you tonight. A lot of on water, prairie, pests, wildlife, wildflowers. I. I don't touch a lot on the grasses. I've, I've got information on them, but the grass is um, complicated. I can send you what would make a good prairie grass seed mix. I have talked with the people at Jack's, which is um, the store that took over where Sears was at in the Frontier Mall. They have got, they now have a pretty decent wild um, prairie grass mix. You want to avoid prairie grass mixes that have smooth brome in them. And for a long, long time, smooth brome was the go-to grass that the Conservation District and Farm Service Agency went to because it was fast growing, it's deep rooted, it was, it was aggressive. Well, now we know a lot more about smooth brome and we know it's not a desirable grass. And it outcompetes the native grass, it'll outcompete the wildflowers. And it really doesn't offer anything back to the environment. It forms a dense mat. It, a dense mat 18 inches deep. When I mean, you talk about thatch. So everyone's trying to get away from that grass. It, it's just not non-native, doesn't, doesn't give anything back. So anything that's got the word wheatgrass in it, western wheat, intermediate, crested, um, those are all very desirable grasses to have in a prairie mix. Um, the wild native rye are, are, are good, alkali grass, sheep fescue, those are all, all ones you wanna see in a mix. Um, if you can't get what you want at Jack's, you can have a custom mix made for you at Sharp Brothers Seed in Greeley. Um, Pawnee Buttes, I, they're not as flexible. They have their own mix and it does have smooth brome in it. Arkansas Valley Seed is another place. And then there's some online. Um, you can go to Applewood Seed. They're down in Golden, um, Colorado. And You're gonna send us a link for that, right? Yep, yep. I'll send a link. Yep. I'll send a, I'll actually, I'll, I'll give you, um, <laughs> I'll send you um, Dr. David Lewis's email because he does the um, wildflower mix order. Yep. Beyond Beauty, uh, another good seed company for wildflower mix. 
Catherine, I, I have a question. I'm wondering, I just moved to this property a couple months ago, so I don't know all what kind of weeds were growing here, but I can tell that there's definitely some disturbed areas um, in the prairie. And I'm wondering if it's better to just leave it alone and see what happens or if there's, if it's, if there are like proactive things you can do for your property, um, you know, should I be thinking about overseeding with native grass seed or wildflowers or something out in my prairie or just sort of leave it alone and see what happens? Yeah. So do you know what was done on the prairie before you that what the previous, did they have, did they graze it? Did they mow it? I don't think they gr grazed it because there's not fencing around. I know one side of the property was grazed by horses intermittently, but that looks pretty intact now. I think it's been a couple of years. Um, I know that they had like heavy machinery on the property because there's a huge like parking lot in the front, um, but it doesn't look like, I mean, I, it doesn't look like a lot of, a lot of the prairie has been disturbed. Okay. Well, that's um, there's a little area, but the problem is there's a little area just east of the house where I'm hoping to plant some fruit trees that looks like it's been disturbed and I can't tell. I mean, the, there's like the, the grass there looks really different. Um, so I don't know what that's going to turn out to look like. Yeah, I'd be happy to come out this spring, summer and walk around and do identification and talk about it. Okay, great. Yep, yep, yep. I'll do that. It's a fun part of my job. I get to go on people's property that I would normally not get invited. <laughs> so that's, that's very cool. And sometimes I'll even send an email out and say, come join me to the whole class. It's a great way to learn. Yeah, come on over, guys. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. OK. So as far as the wildflower goes, I, I haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg and there's a lot of wildflower diversity out on the prairie. You just have to get out there and walk it and, and take a look and see what's going on. Um, I'm always mindful when I am out on the prairie and you know, it, because of, we're, we're in the West, it's high, dry, windy prairie. And, and I have come across rattlesnakes and bull snakes. So for everyone, for everyone who's living out on the prairie, if you go hiking on the prairie and, and have dogs, you can get your dogs vaccinated for rattlesnake. And all of my dogs are vaccinated and it's just a precaution. It's the difference is that if if my one of my dogs get struck by a rattlesnake, it's going to be painful. I'll go to the vet. The vet will give me some antibiotics because on the fangs of those rattlesnakes is a lot of bacteria, and so you've got to be more concerned about bacteria infection at that point than the actual venom. If you don't get your dogs vaccinated for rattlesnake, you're looking at possibly losing the dog or a very expensive long stay at the vet while the dog tries to recover from that massive amount of venom. It cost me like 30 bucks a year for rattlesnake vaccination. I have corgis. They're very curious little legged fun dogs, but uh, everyone's vaccinated. And that's the other thing. Um, so let's talk a, a tiny bit about spiders. Urban myth is that we have brown recluse and we don't, we don't. Um, a lot of people mistake the funnel spiders and um, some of the, we have wolf spiders. And so a lot of people mistake funnel and wolf spiders for brown recluse and we don't. We don't, we also don't have hobo spiders here if any of those spiders come in, they're hitchhikers on someone's luggage or camper, travel trailer, whatever. The problem with most of these spiders and even your, your um, wasp, your stinging insects, wasp, 
is that those stingers and the and the fangs on your spiders got a lot of bacteria. And so that is that bacteria that causes a lot of um, skin damage, tissue damage, and it's not necessarily the, the venom on them. A lot of misconceptions on that. Um, we're just too dry, too cold and dry for brown recluse. If they're if they're here, they're a hitchhiker, and I've seen some interesting hitchhikers. Um, <laughs> so I, I had um, I've had a lot of stuff brought to the office over the years, and one year a guy came in with a a salad container, you know, one of those little um, like a, a muffin clamshell thing, and inside of there was a was a wolf spider. It was huge. It was the size of the clamshell muffin container. <laughs> it was big. And a guy walks in and he holds it up in the office. Of course, my secretaries are all going, whoa. And he goes, what is this? And I go, oh, it's a wolf spider. And it was a, and they get big. They get, they get huge. <laughs> They'll get six inches. The big ones will get like six inches. <laughs> there. And, uh, but again, it's they're not. It, it's the bacteria on the fangs that's what causes the problems. Um, had a tarantula, hawk, wasp, which is one of the largest wasps in North America, brought to the office, and that was a hitchhiker. I had a Scorpio scorpion brought into the office. That was a hitchhiker out of the desert. So again, um, we just don't have a lot of these creatures just because we're so dry. We do have a little native lizard, like a chameleon, very cute. But um, the worst creature we got to watch out for is uh, black widow spiders, native, and the rattlesnakes. Otherwise, um, I always wear boots and blue jeans when I go out on the prairie. I, I'm not a shorts. Uh, wear shorts. So wolf spiders are not uh, dangerous to humans? Not really. They're scary. They jump. Wolf spiders um, are ground dwellers, you know, so they'll, they'll find a burrow, uh, a beetle burrow, or they'll make a burrow into the ground. So they're, they're ground nesters, ground. Or, and so they don't, they don't build webs. So you're not ever going to see one on the side of a house or you know, where you would expect to see a spider, they're in the ground and, and they can jump. And so they, they go after Miller moss and they, they get them by jumping on them. Yeah. Yeah, I looked <laughs> yeah. them up, they're creepy. <laughs> they're big, they get big. Um, funnel spiders, now the funnel spiders, the venom from those guys um, can be toxic, but again, it's, it's the bacteria on the fangs it really causes the problems. Yep. I have a question about snakes. It sounds like the bull snakes may be useful if they eat critters that are going to go after our plants and trees and shrubs and stuff. But is it is it useful to try to attract bull snakes and and not <laughs> attract rattlesnakes? How does that work? Yeah, so this is one of those, this is again one of those urban myths. I just love this. Um, so bull snakes are very useful to have around because they do keep the rodent population down. They'll go after your pocket gophers, um, grasshoppers, all sorts of things. So they're very useful to have around. If you've got bull snakes, you will typically not have rattlesnakes. And a bull snake is a constrictor. So they get around, they wrap around their prey and squish them. So think of like a, like a Python type approach. So, but there's, <laughs> there's no epic battle between a bull snake and a rattlesnake. It's just that the bull snake eats more than a rattlesnake. And so it, it, it eats the food source that a rattlesnake would normally go after. And so the rattlesnake goes someplace else to find food. It's just a food competition thing. 
any experience with trying to get or you know bringing bull snakes under your property to try to eat the gophers and supplant the rattlesnakes <laughs> um i've i've rescued a few i'm not afraid of snakes but at the same time i i i have a lot of respect for them because a bull snake will get a hold of you and not let go so i, I respect that <laughs> and, and so i'll hurt them or i'll i'll get a, a big long like a rake handle or something and so i'll try to pick them up that way and move them but they're um i don't know how to otherwise attract them <laughs> if i find one i'll let you know <laughs> if i have too many i've been reading something about they like to rock rock piles like put a couple around your property and that's where they they're like you know create habitat for them yeah oh yeah yeah because they, they want a sun they're, they're cold-blooded and they they want that warm yeah right they don't do well above night. Thing, though, right yeah oh yeah they're all the same cold-blooded creature creatures and yeah yeah It's never dull. dull. Never dull. <laughs> and then as far as you, what did you say you do to the, the, the gopher burrows? You just sort of smush them whenever you come across them and like rake the hills flat? Yeah, I will just, I just rake those, hit those mounds out flat and I'll spread the soil out. And I just, I just harass them enough that they, they move on. And moving on means that they've come above ground and now something else comes around and eats them. I'm okay with that. Uh, let's see. We use a catch rattlesnake. We used to catch rattlesnakes by putting a loop through a PVC pipe, catching the snake around the net, and dropping them in the bucket and to haul them off. Yeah, that works. What about badgers? Badgers are transient. So they're here today and they're gone tomorrow. They dig a big, they dig a big hole, big. And, and that's all you're ever really gonna see is a big hole because they're here today and gone tomorrow. They're, they're just very, they want, they're wanderers. I have hiked up upon a couple badgers. They're beautiful animals, they're just gorgeous, but you, you gotta you gotta respect something that's a member of the wolverine family make sure that your dogs have a have you've got a good rapport with your dogs and when you say come or leave it they do <laughs> okay anything else All right. So Monday night's class is our perennial and annual class. That's a fun flower class, and that's going to be taught by Kim Parker. And that's going to be on Zoom. So we'll meet back, you know, same Zoom, Zoom room, same time. And uh, so we'll be back here. And Kim's been teaching perennials and annuals for i think 10 years now and she'll teach them she teaches here in laramie county platte county and goshen county and so she's um she's good at it she's she enjoys it she has fun with it she's got pretty pictures of flowers <laughs> it's a fun flower class so i will see you guys all on monday and um And then the, the flower class for Thursday night, um, this is out of Platte County and that and the secretary is going to record it. She's going to put it on the cloud and record it. So I'll be able to get that to everybody and, and I'd like to watch it too, but I got a meeting tomorrow night. So y'all have a great weekend. Don't get blown away and I will see you on Monday.
Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Yep. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Catherine. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank Good you. Good night.